Good morning. <laughs> the time being 9 a.m., I'd like to welcome all of you to the 2023 Joint Economic Briefing on behalf of House Ways and Means and Senate Ways and Means. We also have in the audience most of the members of House and maybe Senate Finance, so welcome everyone. I'm Lori Samborn, and uh, I'll just be your moderator today. Uh, in a normal hearing, we ask that our members don't open up their laptops, but today there's an exception because I think we're going to see some amazing presentations from some of our agency heads. So if you'd like to open up your laptop so you can follow along, please feel free to do so. At the bottom of your agenda is the link to reach all of these handouts that you'll see on the screens, or there's also an email from Jennifer Four, and you can click on that link there to follow along if you'd like. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Michael Kane. Michael Kane is our le legislative budget assistant, and I have a little bit of a bio to give you on him. He has been with the state of New Hampshire Leg Legislative Budget Office for 23 years, and before that, he was with the state of Massachusetts budget offices supporting House Ways and Means. So, um, Michael holds a master's degree in public administration from Suffolk University and a bachelor's degree in political science and philosophy from Merrimack College. So welcome. Thank you very much. Good, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, so just a quick overview of the Legislative Budget Assistance Office. We are a nonpartisan office for, uh, for the general court. Uh, we have uh, 23 auditors who do financial and performance auditors, and then we have seven members in the budget division. Uh, the budget division is the, who the legislature works with on a regular basis. Uh, we'll support um, the House Finance Committees and the Senate Finance Committees. The uh, House Ways and Means and Senate Ways and Means Committees as along, with the, along with the Capital Budget and Public Works Committees. Uh, as far as our support for the House and Senate Ways and Means Committee, you'll meet uh, the Deputy LBA is Chris Shea, so you'll have a chance to meet him. Um, in general, uh, what Chris will do is work with you throughout the House and Senate revenue estimating processes and to help uh, basically combine all the information that you have based on your discussions on where you think a general and education trust fund, highway fund, and fiscal, uh, uh, sorry, fishing game revenue will go. Um, and then to put that into a format to present to the House in a resolution. Uh, typically, the House Ways and Means Committee uh, puts forth a House resolution uh, in usually in the February, March timeframe based on, the, um, you know, how the committee's moving forward. Uh, that information is then presented as a non-binding resolution uh, to the House, who then votes on it. Uh, that information is communicated with the uh, Finance Committee, so the House Finance Committee behind me. Um, they'll have a base revenue estimate, which they will then be able to do their work uh, to create a budget for the next two fiscal years. Uh, so right now we're in fiscal year 23. We're about to enter into a budget process for the 24 and 25 uh, biennial budget. Uh, so our office really is to, you know, communicate between the two committees as well. Uh, any bills that go before the House Ways and Means or Senate Ways and Means committees that may have an impact on the revenues in 24 and 25, we ensure that we keep track of that in a so-called surplus statement, uh, which is really just a catch-all of any bills or legislation or changes that are happening as the budget is being developed. And that is to ensure that there's a balanced budget at the end of the biennium. Um, so that's basically a quick overview of what we do. Uh, feel free to reach out to any member of my staff or myself during the session. Uh, I know we have a lot of returning members. We have a lot of new members. Um, our office is over in the State House uh, in room 101 and 102. So feel free at any time. Um, just to show you before, um, before the budget starts, there's a lot of uncertainty of kind of how the current fiscal year is going to end. We're in fiscal year 23. We're six months through that fiscal year, a little into our uh, seventh month. Um, you've heard in the paper that uh, you know the state had a, a record surplus, say over $400 million over revenue. They had almost $361 million that they ended their fiscal year with uh, for 22, which closed in June. Um, what does that mean? And, and how does that impact the budget process and the revenue uh, estimates going forward? 
So what we usually provide is an, uh, a snapshot. So this is a point in time snapshot of where we are today. And I can guarantee that these numbers on this page, other than the top one, which is a an audited final number of on row two of $361.3 million of the balance that we begin with in 23, all the, all the numbers will change. Um, so just kind of take where we are, $361.3 million to begin the year for 23. During the budget negotiations in 21 or the budget deliberations, that estimate of the 22 balance coming forward in for education and journal fund was estimated at $67 million. So almost $300 plus million variance of the beginning balance. Uh, majority of that, most of that has to do with uh, performance of revenue. Revenue for the last fiscal year, uh, which resulted in the surplus, was almost $400 plus million over uh, what the legislatures had assumed. Um, and you do, I just wanted to remind everyone, when the budget revenue estimates were established, we were just coming out of uh, COVID pandemic uh, shutdown. 20, uh, FY20 actually had a negative uh, balance. And so there was a lot of uncertainty on how the next two years, next three years would really carry out. Um, and so although the uh, your revenue estimates in hindsight uh, were lower than what actually occurred, it's just to remember kind of the pressures on the legislature back in 21 when they were trying to determine really an uncertain path forward for revenue estimates, um, which sometimes is uh, results in a uh, change or a variance in your revenues. Estimated revenue um, on row five in the budget, $2.69 billion. And that's between both the uh, general fund and the education trust fund. General funds about 1.65, close to 1.7 million of that. Uh, the year-to-date variance. So based on the December monthly revenue focus, which is a report that administrative services uh, monitors revenue with during the year, based on the December monthly revenue focus, um, the state is already uh, $207.1 million up, and you are halfway through your fiscal year. So the total revenue for the year estimated about $2.898.4 million, if we assume that from this point forward, continue to hit plan. But you're going to receive monthly revenue focuses for every month. You're going to receive uh, the next couple of months uh, updates from commissioners on where they think the revenues are going to perform for the remainder of the fiscal year. Um, so that $207 million is what we know now, but that number could go up um, or it could go down. And the reason I say that is March and April are big revenue months for collections, especially business taxes, uh, June as well. There were several changes made to the business taxes over the last few years, and I think Commissioner Stepp will talk about it when DRA is here. Um, but March and April are really big revenue months and um, are something that the House will not have necessarily uh, when you're providing your estimates. So you're going to have regular conversations with uh, DRA and some of the larger revenue collect uh, collecting agencies uh, to make your determination where you think, first, where is 23 going to end? And then that's going to be kind of your launching. That's going to be your start for uh, predicting 24 and 25 going forward. You have a lot of economists coming in, uh, a lot of very smart people coming in who have been here for several years who can kind of, you know, help you to identify areas uh, that you should keep an eye on when you're trying to predict two years out. And there's nowhere to, no way to figure out what's going to happen. So it's a best case scenario. But it is a budget process. It is just based on estimates. Um, and so finance, again, once those estimates are done, finance will create their budget. So for appropriations, the budget appropriations, about $2.794 million. It's a little above the $2.7905 uh, that was in the committee of conference budget. A lot of that has to do with uh, timing of when the appropriations are actually uh, applied, 22 versus 23. Unbudgeted appropriations of thirty point nine million. So separate from the budget process, House um, the state also has statutory appropriations or appropriations approved through fiscal in certain instances. 
uh, that are a draw against the general or education trust fund. A couple of those items are your uh, attorney general litigation funds, which are averaging about $8 million over the last couple of years. Uh, you have your judicial counsel indigent defense uh, funding that comes through fiscal committee that uh, I believe they may have another request before the end of the year, but that usually averages between 2 and $3 million a year. You have your education freedom accounts, which uh, you'll know that uh, I think it was estimated about $15 million or 23 um, is where that's going to maybe end up. Um, and then row 12, uh, it's not usually a line that you'll see a lot, uh, a lot of times when we do a snapshot. The state hasn't been in a situation uh, where our revenue has been so high uh, that the legislature um, what had had the ability to basically appropriate funds for specific projects. So over the last the 2022 session there was probably um close to 275 to uh, 300 million dollars of appropriations that went out that was based on the revenue surplus so they knew the governor and the legislature knew that revenue was exceeding plan they knew that the expenditures were in line with where they were estimating and so they um, had legislative specials or specific bills uh, 67 million dollars for highways you have uh, some adequate education changes um, about 14 million dollars uh, for one bill um, that had passed through extraordinary need grants is what they're called and then some retirement uh, one-time costs or to help with the community, some additional aid uh, that the legislature and governor really wanted to make one-time appropriations since they did have those funds available. So in total in 23, we know, although we carried forward about 361.3 million, uh, there's almost 270 million of it between the unbudgeted appropriations and uh, the legislative specials that are already accounted. It's already been spent basically. Uh, but even then, you do have your $200 million revenue surplus. So far, uh, we have an estimated lapse, which is basically uh, unspent funds. Uh, so the legislature will appropriate two years ahead of time. Not all those funds are spent. And when they build the budget, the finance committees will incorporate. And the lapse happens. Uh, because of unfilled positions, and we know the state has a high vacancy rate uh, because of uh, projections that are uh, vary from what was initially estimated. So you do estimate about a $90 million, $89.5 million lapse, which the state has been able to meet uh, the last several years. They've actually come in over $40 million for 22 over the lapse. If you go back to 21, they're almost $100 million over where they thought the estimated lapse was um, for various reasons. So... And that will bring you to your uh, cumulative ending balance on row 18, which is about uh, $282.8 million. That's both general and education trust fund. The education trust fund surplus, just based on these numbers, which will change, is approximately $99.4 million. The remainder being the second year of the biennium, the odd year, uh, the remainder based on statute would go into the rainy day fund. So based on what we know now on row 21, just using the calculations uh, of the rainy day fund, uh, $183.8 million would go into the rainy day fund. Now, you all know people who have been here, the representatives and senators who have been here know that that's gonna be a big discussion during the budget process. Um, not only does the budget process appropriate funds for the next two fiscal years, but they also look at, is there a surplus in the current fiscal year? Um, and then make a decision. Do we let it all go into the rainy day fund? Do we appropriate it for one-time uh, needs? Do we uh, maybe uh, help with our uh, tax burden uh, for, uh, you know, and make some changes in taxes? Uh, it really comes down to what is the governor and the legislature comfortable with for that uh, rainy day fund balance. And over the last couple of years, that's been about $150 million. The cap on the rainy day fund is over $400 million. If, and that's just a rough estimate. We knew we brought in about $2 billion of, or a little under $2 billion last year in general funds. Uh, the cap is two years of general fund revenues for the current biennium. Assuming we get the same $2 billion, that cap's going to be around $400 uh, million. Um, comes out to about three eighty. but you also have settlement money that goes in there that adds to that cap. So roughly about $400 million. Um, If the rainy day fund does hit that cap, then any additional funds automatically carry over into the next fiscal year. So they'd stay into the general fund.
Um, so that will be a, a definitely a discussion. I'm sure the governor's right now is developing the budget, uh, his crack at the budget uh, with the agencies right now. And I'm sure they're discussing what they think uh, the rainy day fund balance should be. You'll hear from many people what a state's rainy day fund balance should be and what's the proper level. But it's really up to the legislature and governor to come up that level that you're comfortable with of surplus funds you're holding on hand. Um and so that's kind of uh, where we are now. Uh, just to point out, I should have pointed out for the education trust fund does not lapse. So it's a non-lapsing fund. Um, we have a couple of years with uh, carrying balances forward in the education trust fund. There was, uh, you know, since its inception, there were general fund transfers into the fund because by statute, any deficit in the education trust fund are filled with a general fund. Um, but right now we're in a, a good position. So there is almost $108 million carried forward from 22 into 23, which is part of that 361 up top. Um, but based on the projected level of spending in the education trust fund, the revenue just through December, uh, that balance will stay right around $100 million. Obviously, that's going to change based on final adequacy counts and final revenue numbers. Um, but again, that balance carries forwards into 24 and 25 uh, for education. So I'll stop there. Um, don't want to overload you with too much, but um, usually what we'll see is our office as we receive the monthly revenue focuses, as we receive, um, you know, the estimates from the Ways and Means Committee, the House Ways and Means Committee, um, as bills start passing and moving through the committees, you'll start to see this snapshot morph into something that will be more of a, a snapshot for the finance chairs. Uh, as they go forward to develop their budget. What's out there? What's changing? Where are we now? Um, and then when the governor releases his budget on February 15th is the deadline or, or is the statutory required date of February 15th, uh, we'll have a first glimpse of what's the um, the first plan on 24 and 25, uh, 23, 24 and 25. Um, and then we'll work with finance and uh, Senate, House and Senate finance over the next several months. So... Hope that helps. I'll kind of stop there, if uh, but I can answer any questions that you have. Sure, Representative Platt. Yes, thank you. This is ignorance because I'm new to ways and means. Who's who, how is the four hundred million dollar rainy day fund cap set? Is that legislation? It is. It's RSA nine thirteen E. Um, it's a calculated step. changed uh, two sessions ago by the legislature it used to be one year of general fund revenues um and, and it was changed this to uh, the biennium ago to be two years of general fund revenues so statute but subject to legislative change other questions janigian please thank you madam chair the, uh, i'm almost afraid to ask this question because maybe i'm missing something but when i look at the total revenue of 2.8 Nine eight, and subtract the appropriations of two point nine seven, I would get a negative cumulative ending balance. So I know I'm missing something because you get two hundred eighty two. Sure. So the total year balance, uh, so the current year balance is negative. Um, if you add the preliminary balance up on row two to the um, your total revenue of the two eight nine eight, that will bring you to the three point um, roughly three point two billion. Then subtract your two ninety seven six point that we did have the cumulative ending balance of two eighty two, which is still positive. But if you look at just the current year, it would be negative because the legislature had planned for a big okay. balance forward. So. I see. Okay. Thank you. Is that all you have for today? That's all I have for I'm today. I'm sure we're going to see more of you soon. You'll see a lot of us, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have the commissioner of DRAs. Uh, there she is. She's right here. Welcome, commissioner. Good morning. Lindsay Stepp has been the commissioner of the New Hampshire Department of Revenue Administration since December of 2017 and previously served as assistant commissioner of the DRA as well as a financial analyst. She became her she began her career, it says at EY, Ernst & Young, is that, is that okay? As an international tax and transfer pricing consultant. And she received her master's of business administration degree from Plymouth State and her bachelor of science degree in economics from Trinity College in Hartford. Thank you very much for coming. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, members of the committee. Lindsay Stepp, Commissioner, New Hampshire Department of Revenue Administration. You should all have a presentation in front of you. It's also showing on the screen. I'm going to walk through today um, with you kind of what DRA does, the taxes that we collect, and kind of the current status of um, revenues. Yeah, so, sorry, just so everybody gets there. That's the first page. It should look like this. Okay. All right. So first, the Department of Revenue Administration, we administer 14 taxes for the state of New Hampshire, uh, representing about $2.6 billion, which is just over 80% of the general and education trust funds for fiscal year 22. So we are the main revenue collecting agency for the general fund and education trust fund. We do have important insights that we'll share with you today about the performance of the state's most significant revenue sources, but we lack the capacity to form uh, perform more complex economic pred predictions, but you have a wonderful slate of people to hear from over the next day and a half. So we'll kind of cue everything up for you, give you um, where we are year to date with revenues, factors that we see affecting the various taxes and what we're seeing in terms of a trend versus plan. And then when you hear from the rest of the economists and other experts over the next couple days, you'll have a nice foundation. So we're gonna go tax by tax. I'll stop, Madam Chair, at the end of each tax if that's okay to answer any questions. Okay. So first we have the meals and rentals tax or MNR as we refer to it. MNR is levied on consumers for the purchase of taxable meals, accommodation rentals, and motor vehicle rentals. The tax rate was 9% through September 30th of 2021 and then lowered to 8.5% on October 1st of 2021. The tax is collected by the operator, the restaurant owner, um, the hotel owner, and then remitted to DRA on a monthly basis. School building aid debt service is paid out of MNR um, every month. The transfer was 14.6 million in fiscal 2012, but has been decreasing over more recent years to 8.1 million in 22 and currently 7 million in 2023. Looking at MNR revenue over the past few years, we have seen a rebound since uh, COVID-19 when obviously a lot of restaurants and hotels were closed. So we saw a hit to MNR revenue during that time. But since everything has been open again, um, we did see an almost 10% decrease um, in 2020 from 2019 due to the shutdowns related to COVID. But when restaurants and hotels opened back up, we saw a 6.1% increase in 21 over 20. And then we've seen a 21.7 increase in 22 over 21 before taking into account the municipal revenue fund transfer. So in um, starting in fiscal 21, nope, I'm sorry, fiscal 22, on a monthly basis, we transfer revenue into a municipal revenue fund. The purpose of that is to send approximately 30% of MNR revenue back to the cities and towns. So we do that transfer on a monthly basis. So when you're looking at net MNR or MNR that's in the general fund in 22 and comparing it to 21, it'll actually look like revenues went down. They didn't. Um, gross revenues actually went up from 21 to 22, but because of the municipal transfer into the restricted account, it'll look like a decrease when you're looking at just the um, general fund portion. So for fiscal 23, our current fiscal year, actual revenue for the first six months is 30.4% ahead of plan and 6.7% ahead of 2022 revenue before that municipal fund transfer. As Mr. Kane mentioned, um, the 30.4% ahead of plan is a large number, but just remember that plan was developed in 2021 um, at a time where there was a lot of uncertainty as we were coming out of COVID. So that's why we're so far ahead of plan. Um, so the 2022 municipal fund transfer, as I mentioned, did not exist in 21. In fiscal 22, that transfer was just over $100 million, 100.1 million. And year to date for 23, we have transferred 66.2 million. Factors that affect MNR revenue, um, low unemployment rates, 
Um, so when people are working, they have the ability to go out to eat, maybe take a vacation, stay in hotels. So currently, uh, the U.S. unemployment rate is at 3.7%. New Hampshire is at 2.6%. For November compared to 4.2% nationally last year and 3.3% uh, for New Hampshire last year. So we've seen even more declines in the unemployment rate, which is good for MNR. Strong wages are also good for MNR, more disposable income, more ability, as I said, to go out to eat, take vacations. Um, weather. <laughs> we like sunny summers. We want colorful foliage, and if it could please snow a little bit more, that would be great. Um, that tends to drive our MNR revenues. We have seen record-breaking tourism in the last few years, both in the fall and in the summers. Hopefully the weather will maybe take a change um, this winter. Um, so that tourism obviously helps our, our MNR revenues. And then consumer behavior post-pandemic. Um, there's more outdoor dining options, expanded takeout options. Um, consumers have kind of shifted from maybe more mainstream hotels to the ability to maybe rent a camp, a cottage, or a, or a home, or a condo for their vacations. Um, these are all positive changes to our MNR tax base. And I really think that we've kind of seen what is a new normal for MNR. Um, maybe if nothing else, COVID taught us that we really like to eat out. And when we couldn't do that for a period of time, um, I think that may have driven post pandemic demand. People now really enjoy the ability to eat out or at least get takeout. Um, and I don't think we all knew how much we liked it until we couldn't do it. Um, rental activity, rental agents, um, just talking about a few different areas of MNR. Rental agents are up 20% over November of last year. Full service hotels are up 10% from November of last year. Full service restaurants are up 6%. Fast food is up 12.5%, all from just last year. So MNR continues to grow. We see increased demand. Um, and as I said, I think this is a bit of a new, a new normal that we're seeing. So I will pause briefly for any questions on MNR. Representative Almy. I'm sorry. No. You. Thank you. Uh, could you tell us where we are relative to 2019? We will look at that in the next few slides. Thank you. <laughs> Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. So I just I want to be clear, we're now, instead of dumping all the R and M and R into the general fund now, we're pulling out our municipal share portion. So it's not counted as general fund necessarily revenue anymore. It's now has a special dedicated fund that based on my math, somewhere between 11 and $12 million a month, we take out of M and R receipts and dump into this set aside fund. That's correct. So last year in total was 100.1 million that went into the municipal transfer fund. Um, this year it'll probably be a little bit more than that. The math is based on the prior year revenues. When we get into more detailed revenue estimating, we can walk the committees through the specific calculation. But thank you. Yeah, comparing year to year, we can at this point really compare. You can compare 23 to 22 because both years had the transfer, but again, the transfer varies year to year. So it, it's probably helpful to just look at MNR on a gross level and then net out the transfer. Thank you. Sure. Senator Rosenwald. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I've noticed that um, generally the rooms portion is about 17% of the total MNR revenues, but this year it's something like 24 or 25. And you've, while well, the, the restaurants are coming in kind of just around plan, you mentioned the change in rooms from hotels to rental agents and condos. Is the department also looking at to what extent the emergency rental assistance federal funds that are going into hotels is driving that portion of the revenues or will you be able to tell us that it, potentially so the MNR tax is going to tax a short term rental so 6 months or less so if any of those rentals are longer than 6 months or anticipated to be longer than 6 months then they wouldn't be taxable here but that's certainly something that we can we can look into in greater detail for you representative Ellery has a question Thank you. Um, Commissioner, 
you were talking about the, the following up on uh, Senator. I got to get that senator in there now. Lang's uh, comment regarding the the thirty percent that's going back into the the municipalities. Is there some way we could see? With that taken out, the comparison of the meals and rooms going into the general fund now minus the 30, so we can see whether or not we're losing, uh, there's uh, less revenue going to the general fund. Yes. You, you understand what I'm saying? Yes. We can, when we get into the specific revenue estimatings with the committees, we'll show it both ways. So you'll see the gross amount of total MR collected. Then we can show you what's going into the municipal revenue or re municipal transfer fund. Then also show you the net. So you can see what it would look like if that transfer wasn't happening and then see what it is with the transfer. Follow up. Can you give us a, a rough? idea now is there an increase decrease level mnr is growing so in general so um yeah <laughs> that's wonderful news yeah senator lane just one more thing for committee members if you get the notice i do lay uh, started on the 15th every month you get the revenue notices that come out just remember that 11 million dollars is going to drop out of that total when you're reporting it to somebody so if it says we have 207 million dollars remember to subtract 11 million dollars because that's actually going to be the surplus that's a great point so when we report revenues during the month as senator lang said starting on the 15th you will see the revenue before the transfer and so we will look very much ahead of plan because that transfer hasn't come out yet. There is a footnote in the bottom that will tell you what the transfer is, the specific amount for that month. Um, but yes, yeah, so it always looks like on the 15th, 16th, 17th of the month, 18th, 19th, we're looking great. Um, and we're still usually end up ahead of plan, but we look grossly ahead of plan um, before that transfer comes out. That's a great point. Thank you. Oh, Representative Elberger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm finding myself a little bit confused about something on page three. Mm -hmm. The second bullet point, it says the transfer was $14.6 million per year in FY22, gradually decreasing in 2022. Right. So in, in fiscal 2012, we transferred $14.6 million to the school building aid debt service. Right. In fiscal 22, we the transfer was only 8.1 million okay. and then i assume and that 7 million in 23. i assume that 7 million is year to date that would be for the total year so the debt service amounts were set back um when the bonds were issued so that is 7 point .1, 7 million is the total amount that would be transferred in 23. thank you thank you madam chair uh quick follow-up from senator lang and then uh representative rochefort next so just, just on that, that building aid transfer, if I did my math right from the education committee side, we have about $151 million left in bonds that go out to 2041 um, to, to lay off. That's broken down into two pieces. One's a municipal payment that is about $107 million. And then is a $43, uh, $43 million um, Back in 2010, 11, we bonded operating expenses. We have about $43 million left of that bond to pay off as well. Representative Rochefort. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, looking at the factors that affect the future meals and room tax revenue, um, I, it's kind of a two-part question. So how effective is the state in collecting meals and rooms from short-term rentals, the Airbnbs, the VRBOs, the, those groups? Yep, those... Um, you can see a list of all MNR licensees on our website, all MNR operators. The two that you mentioned are licensed operators. Um, and so they will collect on behalf of the host and remit to the state. Okay. And then a follow up to that or, or along the same questions. I know there's a lot of discussion, at least in my part of the state, about restricting uh, short term rentals and, um, and, and, and putting more regulations on that. Does that factor into? future meals and room tax revenue if there are less ability to rent out homes and second homes for, for that? Sure. So if um, a consumer wants to rent out a second home um, and that's not available because of short-term rental restrictions, they would really have one or two options, right? You can go to a hotel um, 
or you cannot come at all. So if the result is that fewer people rent any sort of taxable accommodation, then we would see it an impact to MNR. If instead that is just a shift to a different type of taxable accommodation from a short-term rental to a full service hotel, then the impact on revenue would be minimal. Thank you. Sure. Let's go ahead and move on. Sure. Oh, I know one more behind you, Representative McGuire, sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. How are these uh, funds apportioned among the various municipalities? So that's a great question, um, and I don't, I'm going to face this way, okay. <laughs> um, so meals and rentals operators remit to the state on a monthly basis. Um, they can remit on a consolidated basis. So if I am a restaurant owner and I have a restaurant in um, Plymouth, Concord, and Manchester, I can file a consolidated return and report all of my revenues um, on one return. And they're not required to break out the revenue that's received by each location. So for that, to answer that question, it can be, it's difficult, almost impossible for us to know um, how much m &R revenue is generated in each specific municipality. Also, if we were able to do that, if operators were required, um, it would be additional work and reporting on the part of the operator, but if they were required to break down their MNR by municipality, in theory, we could report um, by municipality, except when you have the potential for municipalities that have very few operators. So if you have a small town that has two restaurants, um, the DRA, based on our internal policies, would not be able to disclose that information because if I'm the owner of one restaurant, and I know there's only two in the town, and DRA told me there was $100 of revenue, and I know that I was 25, then I know that my competitor had 75% of that. So we get into a little bit of a disclosure issue. But really, the, the first kind of hiccup is the ability for operators to file consolidated returns. Would you be OK with a quick follow-up question sure. on that? Yeah. So I guess I, I wasn't clear. How do you know? How much of a check to send to one town versus the next versus the next? Oh, for the distribution. The distribution. So that distribution is done based on population. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go ahead and move on again. All of my Ways and Means members, we're going to be seeing the commissioner yeah, yeah, again see, very soon. Yes. And we're going to drill down on this <laughs> again. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so moving on to slide four, we'll just talk a little bit more about MNR. Um, Factors, additional factors that can impact MNR revenue is obviously consumer behavior, as we've mentioned, any sort of supply chain constraints um, that may impact a restaurant's ability to offer um, either services in general um, or offer specific types of food. If you know, we saw some of that, I think, during COVID, most of that has resolved. But um, if there's any supply chain impacts, obviously inflation is something that we're watching in terms of m and tax revenue, whether fuel prices and food costs will require restaurants to raise their prices. That could have a positive impact on m and revenue because the m and is collected based on the amount that the consumer pays. So as prices go up, m and revenue could go up as well. Um, economic uncertainty, again, if we get to a point um, where folks feel uncertain about their position in the economy and they choose to not go out to eat or not take those vacations, we would see an impact to m and um, As I mentioned uh, previously, just the shift in consumer spending from pre-pandemic to current spending pattern may continue into the long term, as I mentioned, when we all realized how much we like to eat out um, when we couldn't do it for a period of time. That seems to be a little bit of a permanent change to consumer behavior. Are you open to a question sure. on that, Representative Almy? Thank you. You don't have labor force shortages in this, and for restaurants and hotels, including the one I'm in at the moment, uh, it's pretty drastic. <laughs> that is a great point. Um, I think we've all seen restaurants that either can't open for the full, you know, offering lunch and dinner every day of the week, um, those constraints as well. That's a great point, Representative. Thank you. On slide five, this shows the 10-year trend. <clears throat> In m and revenue, you see generally we had seen an increase year over year in revenue from 2013 to 2019. You'll see that dip in 2020, a recovery in 2021, 
And then as we talked about, it looks like there's a dip in fiscal year 22, but this is reporting general fund revenue. So this is after the municipal um, fund transfer. So fiscal 2021 revenues of 334.7, the transfer did not exist. Fiscal 22 at 307.2, that is net of the $100.1 million transfer. So gross MNR in fiscal 22 was 407.3. So we have seen an increase in revenue. Um, again, as we mentioned earlier, you'll see we are significantly exceeding plan, but plan was developed during um, a lot of uncertainty during COVID. Senator Link. Uh, Commissioner, so if I look at 19, I'm sorry, yeah, 19 and 22, to make them equalize, I have to add about $107 million back in, giving us a revenue of about uh, $414 million, and that would be equal to uh, what we look at in 19. So we're ahead of, we're about $50 million in gross revenue ahead, but after the adjustment. Correct. correct? Thank you. Correct. Senator Innes. A uh, real quick question. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen a lot of inflation in restaurant prices. Hotel mm -hmm. rates have gone up significantly. How much of this increase is due to inflation as opposed to a real increase in business? And when that inf inflation subsides, as we hope, um, <laughs> what will be the impacts on, on this revenue? What I'm trying to say is maybe we shouldn't get quite so excited as we are. So I think the the inflation increasing revenues you also need to factor in if that inflation and increased prices has impacted consumer demand. And so that's kind of the balance that we maybe don't have the best insight into because we're just reporting the revenue. But if food prices are increasing, so M&R is increasing and the demand is still there and consumers are still spending, but then we see those prices go back down you could potentially see a hit. So yeah, it, it's it's kind of the balance of the demand versus the prices. Thank you. You're welcome. Representative Almy. Thank you. Um, we have a excellent on um, marketing program in economic affairs on um, which changes who it's going after depending on whether there's a lot of money washing around in New England or or isn't at the time. And would that be, um, do you know, well, maybe we can find out from them on where they've been spending their money in the last year. Yeah, this, I, this program actually, until we started hitting major bumps, was giving us 5% more a year for years. I believe Commissioner Caswell is coming up right after me, and I'm sure he'll be happy to talk about it. He and I had a brief conversation last week about some of the um, targeted marketing that they do, when they do it, why they do it, and how quickly they can shift it if need be. It was actually pretty fascinating, so hopefully he'll cover that with you as well. On slide six... Um, this gets to what Senator Rosenwald um, brought up earlier. I don't have fiscal 23 year to date on here, um, but this will just show you kind of the breakdown between meals, rentals, and motor vehicles as the components of MNR. So meals is the largest portion of our MNR revenue. The breakdown is fairly consistent. Um, I would just note fiscal 21, you saw a little bit of a shift towards the meals with meals being just 80 or going up to 82.1 percent where it had been hovering around 80 almost consistently in prior years and then in 22 was kind of a precursor to what senator rosenwall mentioned where we've kind of now she seen that shift into rooms rooms is up to 18 percent um in fiscal 22 where it had been 15 16 17 previously and i think when we look at um 23 numbers as Re senator rosenwald mentioned you'll see that shift even more so we just kind of look to see um, the breakdown so that we can follow the trends of what's happening in the various components. Representative Ullery. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, when we get into the drill down, uh, I've noticed that the uh, 81 to 79.7 uh, percent on the, the meals, can we have, uh, well, will you be able to provide our relative uh, 
meals and rooms tax comparison to the other states and some commentary as to why that's down at 79 instead of back up at 80 as uh, I'm, I have a suspicion, but I just would love to know. Sure. We can look at the rates in other states. We also can look at a breakdown, a more detailed breakdown, as I mentioned in previous slides about what makes up meals. So whether it's fast food, for instance, right during COVID, we saw a significant increase in fast food, a decrease in full service restaurants, right? McDonald's was open, but maybe Applebee's was closed. Um, so we can give you a more detailed breakdown of the components within each of these as well. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Representative Southworth. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, as a follow-up to uh, Jordan's question, I'm interested in this data um, about the pieces that are really kind of the large discrepancy in New Hampshire, where you have businesses closing, new businesses opening up, some are just barely getting by, um, you know, all those things. We kind of hear about the middle in all these presentations, but as many people know, New Hampshire has a huge range. I mean, I'm from the seacoast, business is booming, but that's not true in other parts of the state. We can, we have a breakdown of M&R revenue also by county. So we can show it to you by county um, and the changes over time. We can also give you data on the number of licenses that have closed as opposed to new licenses that have opened. Again, we can do that by county. So we, that's a great point. We can get into that as well. Okay. Next up, the real estate transfer tax on page seven. The real estate transfer tax is imposed on the sale, transfer, or granting of real property at a rate of $1.50 per $100 of the price or consideration of the transfer. Half is paid by the seller, half is paid by the buyer. Rent has increased in recent years. We saw a 3.7% increase in 2020 over 2019, a 32.4% increase in 21 over 20, a 10.9% 10 10 increase in 22 over 21, for fiscal 23, actual revenue for the first six months is 26.3% ahead of plan and 5.4% ahead of prior year. This is, I think, what we've all seen in a bit of a real estate boom here in New Hampshire, maybe possibly driven by COVID and folks wanting to move to New Hampshire, move out of um, more urban areas. Um, things that we are watching at this point are the interest rates, obviously, as those go up, um, that makes potential buyers uh, more difficult for buyers to buy or might um, dissuade buyers from buying in the first place. Mortgage rates increased from th just over 3% in October of 21 to 6.9% in October of 22. So rising interest rates are something that we're watching. Um, inflation, um, as that maybe pinches some household budgets that may um, impact whether or not folks are able to purchase um, or move to a new home. The slowing of demand, obviously driven, as I mentioned, by the interest rates, by inflation. Um, the other thing that, that I think is worth noting with respect to the real estate transfer tax is property values. So uh, property values were $214.1 billion. That's the total equalized value for all property in New Hampshire for April of 2022 versus $193.5 billion in April of 21. So 22 saw a 10% increase in total equalized value in New Hampshire over 21. The previous years, we were looking at a 5% year-over-year increase. So we have seen significant increase in the value of property um, in recent years. Factors that can affect the future um, re revenue, the housing market trend. Home prices may have peaked, we're not sure. I don't know. Um, if they have peaked, um, that could impact rent revenue. Decline in the demand, again, from the interest rates, from the higher prices, and just the low inventory that we've seen for a number of years now. With RET, the thing to remember is that it's a balance between the number of sales, the sales volume, and the prices. So sales can fall as we've seen at times, but if prices go up, that can sustain the RET revenue. The opposite is also true. 
if the number of sales increases, but the prices go down, again, the RET revenue can be sustained. It's really when we start to see the volume go down and the prices go down that we see that impact on RET. Um, we continue to watch the economy, low unemployment rate, strong wages. Generally, that is good for the housing market. The inflation rate, rise in prices, energy prices, energy prices, especially this time of year, that's something that a home buyer is likely to take into account when deciding whether or not to purchase a home. Um, and then just general economic uncertainty. If buyers are uncertain about the economic future, that may dissuade them from purchasing. Future outlook, changes in interest rates. Will they continue to climb? How long will they climb? How high will they go? And the tapering buyer demand. So average days on the market increased 7.7% in November of 22 as compared to November of 21. And pending sales decreased in 22 as compared to 21. So it the market is cooling. It's not that same as soon as it's listed, it's sold for 10% above asking. It's starting to, to come down a bit. Year-over-year -year change for November 22. New property listings and pending sales decreased for single family homes and condos. For November 22, the sales price and monthly supply of inventory increased. So again, we're seeing the volume decline. The, the price increase along with the inventory. So the homes are staying on the market a little bit longer, but the prices are still um, increasing. November 22, single-family home had a 20-year low for the affordability index. So the housing affordability index measures whether a typical family earns enough to qualify for a mortgage loan. So an index of 120 would mean that median household income is 120% of what they would need to qualify under the prevailing interest rates. So any any affordability index over 100 means that median income would qualify you for purchasing a home. November 22 is currently at 69%. So median family income is not enough to qualify, you're about 30% short, to qualify for um, purchasing a home at the prevailing interest rates. It means that homes are getting harder to afford, therefore the sales volume is likely to start to decline. On page 10, this is the 10-year revenue trend for the real estate transfer tax. You will note that the 22 plan is on the green line, which was 197.8. In fiscal 22, revenue was 232.6, so we exceeded plan. And the 23 plan is in the red line, which is 181.9, which is less than the 22 plan. So we anticipated that the increase in RET that we had seen as a result of COVID and during COVID was going to start to decline. It hasn't happened yet. So you'll see the revenues um, are exceeding plan and still exceed prior year. But I think it's coming. <laughs> um, the, the housing market signs are indicating that it is slowing. Um, so we might start to see either RET level off or maybe start to see a bit of a decline. But we can talk about that in greater detail when we get into the actual revenue estimates. And we will have some presentations from realtors in the, both the residential and commercial world coming tomorrow. So uh, Representative Perfect. Petrie has a question, and then Senator Murphy, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for taking my question. Do you have a breakdown of property values by county? We do. We break down a property values by county and also by town, and that's available on our website, but I can get a, um, a link to the chair to distribute to the Thank committee. You. Perfect. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. One quick question. This housing affordability index, is that a New Hampshire-specific number? That is. All right. Thank you. Senator Lane? So sticking with that question, that line, <clears throat> the, the affordability index is really a, a price and interest rate as compared to wage is that is yes. that the the breakdown of that yeah. and as your price goes up and the interest goes up your if your wage doesn't go up in the same matter then you're more likely to not be able to get an affordable home correct thank you correct please continue okay. 
Next, we have the tobacco tax. So the tobacco tax is um, on levied on each pack of cigarettes at a dollar seventy eight per pack of twenty, and two dollars and twenty three cents cents per pack of 25 that um, is indicated by a stamp that goes on the bottom of every pack of cigarettes that's sold. The tobacco tax is also levied on all other tobacco products at a rate of 65.03% rate of, of the wholesale sales price. So that would be your loose tobacco, other products like that. Stamp sales um, and OTP make up the total tobacco tax. So we tend to report um, in the revenue focus, et cetera, on the total tobacco tax, but we'll give you a bit of a breakdown here again so you can see the different components. I would note, and I'll go into detail um, in a later slide, that other tobacco products also includes the taxation of e-cigarettes. And we'll talk about those are taxed a little bit differently, and we'll talk about that in a couple slides. So tobacco tax revenue over the last three years, we saw a 5.7% increase in 2020 over the prior year, an 18.1% increase in 21 over 20. Then we saw an 8.2% decrease in 22 from 21. Year to date, we are 7% below plan and 4.7% below prior year. The share of OTP continues to grow. So if you think of it like a pie chart, the largest portion of revenue is stamp sales, but the portion that is other tobacco products is growing. So it currently makes up 13.2% of the tobacco tax compared to in fiscal 2012, it was 3.4%. So again, we're seeing a little bit of a shift to other tobacco products and away from the traditional cigarettes and stamp sales. Factors that contribute to our tobacco tax revenue cross-border elasticity. It is estimated that 52.4% of cigarettes sold in New Hampshire are consumed outside of New Hampshire. So we have a very low tax rate compared to our surrounding states. So we see a lot of our cigarettes um, go to other states. It's important to note, I think, if you actually look at the number of, of stamps that we sell and you look at our population, um, it would probably be very jarring if, if we were to actually consume all of those cigarettes here. We'd probably have um, some severe public health crises. Um, so it's just know that about half of our cigarettes that are sold are consumed outside of state. Obviously, public sentiment on tobacco consumption. Um, we tend to see a little bit of a dip in, in tobacco tax stamp sales in the beginning of the year, maybe as there's some New Year's resolutions to quit smoking. Um, so you know, January, February tend to be lower months in revenue for us. So as, as um, public sentiment changes relative to tobacco, that can impact the tobacco tax. Availability of menthol and flavored tobacco products that are banned in Massachusetts. So since June of 2020, um, Massachusetts has banned all flavored tobacco products, including menthol cigarettes. That has driven a lot of demand to New Hampshire, especially at our border towns. The initial impact um, was estimated to be a 22% increase in New Hampshire. Um, so again, we already have the lower tax rate we had that cross-border elasticity, and then there were products that were no longer available in Massachusetts that people came to New Hampshire to purchase. There is also a potential federal ban on menthol-flavored cigarettes and all flavors and cigars. Um, that would prohibit New Hampshire as well from selling those products. The soonest that that would go into effect would be roughly a year from now, uh, 1124. The impact on our revenues would really depend on if consumers that are purchasing menthol cigarettes and flavored cigars, whether they would shift to a different product, a non-mentholated product or a non-flavored cigar, or whether they would stop consuming altogether. So it's really the consumer behavior that would ultimately drive the impact on revenues. This is something that we're watching um, and we can you know, talk to the committees um, as you get into revenue estimating about what we think in terms of the likelihood, um, what would happen if this federal ban went into effect. Commissioner. Sure. Representative Ulrich, if you have a question. Uh, thank you again, Commissioner. Uh, just so that we're perfectly clear, New Hampshire does not uh, discriminate between uh, flavored and non-flavored uh, on our tax rate, so there's no way we would know what the impact would be. 
The, the only way we would know would be to talk to our wholesalers. Um, they're the So the wholesalers purchase the tobacco tax stamps from us. They sell to the retailers and then the retailers sell to the consumers. Um, we have a good working relationship with the wholesalers. So we can get some estimates on um, how much menthol cigarettes they sell compared to non-mentholated. Um, but again, it would really it's an estimate um, in terms of what the impact would be. And the, to your Everything point- Everything we do here is a guesstimate. Right. <laughs> Thank you. And to your point, the tax rate is not different. So there's not an easy way to do that. Thank you, Representative Almy. Thank you. Um, it's quite a difference between 20 and uh, 21, 21 to 22. And we've got just, as I recall, we have one major distributor and a couple of somewhat smaller ones on. And one of the answers to that would be if they had decided, as they sometimes have done in order to send a signal to us or someone else, that they were going to not get bonds for the month before the end of the year and get them after that. On, I don't know, that's half of the question. The other one is on, can you find out what Massachusetts thinks is going on with their menthol customers? Uh, that is, are they quitting because it's too much trouble to come up here and acquire their cigarettes? Or on uh, perhaps going to eat vaping or something? Or, um, What's going on? Sure. So to answer your first question, yes, we track the amount of bond um, receivable we have in any given month, and we can go over that in greater detail when we come before the committee. In terms of what's happening in Massachusetts, there's actually a tax foundation study that was done, which is where I got some of my numbers, that showed um, that New Hampshire had that roughly 20 to 22 percent increase in stamp sales, and Rhode Island did as well. So there was a, a a move of consumers um, when they couldn't buy their mentholated products in Massachusetts anymore, they kind of went to the two closest states to do so. There is probably also a shift um, to e-cigarettes, um, and and we're actually gonna I'm gonna talk about that in a greater detail in the next couple of slides, so we can we can look at what's been going on with respect to e-cigarettes. Thank you, Michelle. Just remind the members we have. There's what, 30 pages, 32 pages in this slide presentation. We have about 40 minutes left because we want to take a break after this presentation before the next one. So the commissioner is going to be in front of both the Senate and the House Ways and Communities Committee a lot. You'll get her nowhere on a first name basis. So there'll be plenty <laughs> of chance to ask her questions. Okay, so page 12. I mentioned taxation of e-cigarettes. So the e-cigarette tax went into effect on January 1st of 2020 in New Hampshire. It is levied on both closed systems, which is when you purchase, or so they tell me, um, a single piece, an e-cigarette that's one piece, um, and also on open systems, which is where you have an interchangeable um, or refillable liquid. The closed systems and open systems are taxed differently. So the closed system rate is 30 cents per milliliter on the volume of the liquid, or other substance that's containing nicotine in the cartridge. And then on an open system, it's 8% of the wholesale sales price. So this is different than the 65.03% OTP tax rate. E-cigarettes are taxed um, differently from that. The chart on this page, really all it's showing is from the inception of the taxation, um, just the increase that we've seen. Um, so you'll see that in July of fiscal 21, we were, um, collecting a, just over 300000 in tobacco tax revenue from e-cigarettes on a monthly basis. Now, coming into fiscal 23, we had a high in July of 843000 843, and we're just um, about 760000 in December. So we've seen a significant increase in revenue um, due to the taxation of e-cigarettes. This slide is just showing the 10-year trend on page 13, as we've seen from other taxes. I just point out, if you look from fiscal 16 to fiscal 19, you'll see a consistent downward trend. This is something that Representative Almy and I have talked about numerous times in Ways and Means. 
We were seeing a roughly 3% de decrease in tobacco tax revenue year over year. It felt like we knew what was happening. We knew what was going on. Then COVID hit, Massachusetts banned certain products, and from 19 to 21, we saw an increase in tobacco tax revenue. 21 to 22, you will see that decrease. This might be more of the normalizing. Um, you know, not only the Massachusetts ban of certain products, but I think also COVID, it being a stressful time, there was a lot of uncertainty. It was probably not the time that a lot of folks um, decided to quit smoking. Um, it, the, the other external factors um, at the time may have driven some demand. So we may be seeing some normalizing year-to-date numbers compared to prior years seem to indicate the same thing. So we may start looking at that more 3 to 4% year-over-year decrease as we move forward. Page 14, this is showing you just tobacco tax stamp revenue. So this is just the, the tax on the packages of cigarettes. You'll see again that downward trend 16, 17, 18 was relatively flat, 19 decreased, but then the increase in 21, 20 and 21, most likely due again to COVID and the menthol ban in Massachusetts. And then on page 15, this is just showing you other tobacco product stamp, uh, other tobacco tax um, revenue. The blue is your traditional OTP revenue at 65.03% of the wholesale sales price. The orange portion is when we added e-cigarettes. So orange is just showing you the portion of OTP revenue related to e-cigarettes. And again, you can see that that has been growing um, since we implemented that tax. Next up, we have the interest and dividends tax. IND is assessed on interest and dividend income of individuals, partnerships, and fiduciaries. The tax rate was 5% 5 5 for taxable periods ending on or before December 31st of 2022 and is in the process of being phased out. So the rate will be 4% for taxable periods ending on or after December 31st of 2023, the calendar year that we are currently in. We will go to 3%, then 2%, then 1%, and then the tax will be fully repealed for periods beginning after December 31st of 2026. IND revenue over the past few years has fluctuated a little bit. We've seen an increase of just under 10% from 19 to 20. We saw a 4% decrease from 20 to 21, but then saw a 30% increase from 21 to 22. Actual revenue for the first six months is 1.8% above plan. We're actually pretty close to plan, so um, that's performing well. And 5.4% above last year. Factors that can impact IND, economy and stock market performance, obviously. Changing makeup of how um, IND is paid over time, for example, distributions. We'll talk about this in a later slide. You hear interest and dividends, and so interest and dividends are the first things that come to mind in terms of the tax base, but we also tax distributions. And so as those components, the mix of those components changes over time, that can impact the tax. How much money you have in the bank and interest rates also impacting IND as interest rates go up, that would indicate that we would receive additional IND revenue. 10-year trend. Um, Fairly consistent increase in revenue from 2016 to 2020, that slight dip in 21, and then increased revenue again in 22. You will see that the 22 and 23 plans are very close to one another. We expected that revenue um, might kind of be um, have limited growth from 22 to 23. Also included in that is the impact of the tax rate change. This shows you the breakdown of the components that I was just mentioning. At the bottom is probably the easiest way to see it in the chart. You'll see the percent of IND that is from distributions, from dividends, from federal tax exempt income, and then from interest. If you look at tax year 21, you'll see that distributions were 48.2%, made up 48.2% of the IND revenue that we received. That is a significant increase from the 17.9% in 2012. 
So that's really a sign of, of a strong economy, strong profits that are being distributed um, and then therefore taxed. You will also notice the interest portion in 2012 was 35.9 percent. In tax year 21, it was 9 percent. So again, lower interest rates, um, making up a smaller component of the IND tax as a whole. We may see, and I expect that we will see this interest portion increase as interest rates increase. All right, I guess we have a number of backed up questions here. So we'll start with Representative Platt and go to Senator uh, y Yes, thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank that you. chart has no legend. What color means what? I noticed that as I was talking. <laughs> That's why I referred you to the chart at the bottom. Uh. <laughs> we will add a legend to that. I believe the distributions are blue, the dividends are orange, the federal tax exempt interest is gray, and regular interest is green. Senator Rosewall. Thank you, Madam Chair. To to what extent does the department have information on large family trusts where the IND liability is transferred to an individual's tax return versus just like a family who pays IND tax. Do we know anything about these trusts that we've enabled? We can look into that. I mean, all that we're going to know is what's reported to us. So if it if it's not taxable, it's not going to show up on anything that we receive. So there has been, you know, changes in in recent years to um, the trust statute in New Hampshire. And so we can we can try to do a bit of analysis looking back over time, but we're only going to have information of what's reported to us on a tax return. Thank you. As a representative, um, Porovich, how do I? Thank you. Looking at the distributions and interest together, and I, I'm curious how much of that change is due to the you know strength of the economy, and how much is due to the federal uh, you know policy of keeping interest rates artificially low, which increases the interest anybody can get. There is no income to tax because there is no interest to receive. While you know the same policy results in large distribution because the profits are fueled by the you know excessively low interest rates. So. Correct. That's a great point. And something that we can do when we come before the committees is not only give you the percentages, but give you the dollar amounts, so you can see whether you know to your point, um, it may be fairly consistent interest amounts but it's looking like a smaller proportion because of the total pie. So the percentages can be a little bit mis potentially misleading. So we can give actual dollar figures for the totals, which might be easier to, um, to see what's going on there. Thank you. Representative Almy. Thank you. Um, I was asking this question yesterday, actually, but on, we just started hearing about distributions a couple of years ago. I guess I see why now, but can you explain the difference between distributions that is in the tax law, uh, between distributions and uh, dividends or interest? When we come before Ways and Means next, we're going to give you a more detailed primer on each of the taxes and how they operate so we can get into that detail at that point. And that'll hopefully serve as a bit of a reference for you going forward. Thank you. Could I just have a very short follow-up follow on are the distributions something that only uh, stockholders get? Not necessarily. Okay. I don't believe so. But we'll confirm that for you. Oh, you do. Representative Janine. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm wondering if uh, when I look at the distributions increasing so dramatically, I'm wondering if there's a real estate sales component to that, because if you've got companies that are handling real estate, selling real estate, buying and and uh, flipping, might that distribution 
Number Potentially. By that. Potentially. And that's why, too, I think it would be helpful to see the actual numbers as opposed to just the percentages. And I wish I had thought of that before right now um, so that you can see, you know, distributions of, has increased as a percentage of total IND over time. But it would be helpful to see the actual dollar increase as well um, because this might be a little bit inflated. Thank you. Okay. Please continue. Okay. Utility property tax. So we have a couple of smaller taxes that I'm going to cover, and I'll try to go through these quickly, and then we'll talk about business taxes. You'll notice I saved that for the end. Um, so the utility property tax is imposed on the value of utility property at a rate of $6.60 per $1,000 of value, and the DRA determines those values as of the April 1st of each year. Audited UPT revenue over the past few years, we saw a 9.6% increase year over year in 20, an 11.8% decrease in 21, 13.4% increase in 22. Year to date, we are 3.5% ahead of plan and 9.9% ahead of prior year. Tax year 22 assessments were $43.6 million. That's based on a utility property value of $6.6 .6 billion. Factors that it can impact UPT, obviously the development of new uh, renewable energy facilities, that's more taxable property. The valuation of the property directly drives the taxes that we collect. And then energy prices, supply and demand, that can impact obviously the profits of the utilities and then the profits contribute to the value that we assess them at. So these are, are all things that kind of contribute to the utility property tax. I did not include a graph um, or any chart for this one. It's roughly between 40 and $45 million a year. It's pretty straightforward. Communication services tax. Oh, sorry. Sorry, while we're yep. there, Representative yep. Allery, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner, again. Sorry. No worries. Uh, the, the question is, this 6.6 .6 per thousand, and the, we recently had the upgrades that took place throughout the southern part of the, the state with, you know, screwed up traffic and everything else. Uh, what effect, or is there a method that your office, methodology by which your office could determine what effect that had on the overall cost, if any, of providing uh, electricity to consumers in the state? We wouldn't have any information about the cost to the consumers. We would just be looking at any impacts to the value of the utility property itself. Okay. Thank you. I just want <laughs> uh, I wonder how we can get that information. It would be very interesting to know. Thank you. Sure. You're welcome. Communication services tax. 7% on all two-way communications. In 2012, um, an exclusion of charges for internet access decreased CST revenues significantly. We cannot go back on that change. There is a federal prohibition on um, taxing internet access. New Hampshire was grandfathered into that provision, but since it has been repealed, we can no longer um, tax internet access. Um, and you can see, you know, CST used, used to be between 76 and a half to $81 million. Following the removal of the taxation of internet access, it's dropped um, to 47.1 to 59.3 million. And then in the last three years, we've con continued to see other declines in CST as well. Uh, fiscal 22 CST revenue was just under 30 million. For the first six months of the year, we are 23.8% below plan and 6.4% below prior year. Things that have uh, impacted the CST revenue outside of the taxation of internet access, just a decrease in landlines. As you all know, for a long time, people had a landline and a cell phone, uh, maybe a landline and two cell phones. Now there's just fewer and fewer landlines, more cell phones. Um, so the decrease in landlines affects CST. Modern pricing and purchasing trends for wireless communications. So if you look at your cell phone bill, you will see um, typically that there is a portion of your bill that you pay that is related to your data usage and a portion that is related to your voice. That data is internet access and is not taxable. 
the voice portion is taxable. So as wireless communication companies have shifted the portion of your bill away from voice to data, that has a negative impact on CST revenue. VoIP and video conferencing, that has a positive in impact on CST revenue, um, something that has um, maybe uh, uh, increased a bit during COVID as we all learned how to use Zoom and other um, video conferencing and VoIP options. Um, so that is, could have a positive impact to CST revenue. CST revenue, as you'll see, is just about $30 million a year. It's a relatively small revenue source. Okay, business taxes. New Hampshire has two business taxes. We have the business enterprise tax and the business profits tax. The bet is assessed on the sum of all compensation paid or accrued, interest paid or accrued, and dividends paid by the business. The BPT is assessed on income from the conduct of business activity within the state. So BPT is your traditional um, business income tax. BET is a tax regardless of whether your business is profitable. The BPT conforms to the Internal Revenue Code in effect on December 31st of 2018 for taxable periods beginning on or after 2020. So we are currently conformed to the code of December 31st of 2018. In order to change that code, um, there needs to be legislation. We are not what is call called a rolling conformity state where we just update the code as it changes. We are static conformity. So we conform to a specific date and then the legislature decides to update the date if they so choose. Factors that affect business taxes, obviously the economy, federal tax reform and stimulus programs, mergers and acquisitions, various credits or exemptions, and statutory changes. On page 22, we'll talk about some of those statutory changes that have happened in recent years. First, market-based sourcing for taxable periods beginning on or after December 31st of 21. This, is rel this impacts um, a multi-state's business apportionment, how they apportion their income for services that they provide. We were what was called a cost of performance state where you would look to where the service um, was performed. A market-based sourcing state that we are now, we look to where the customer is. So if I'm an accountant and my customer is in Massachusetts, under a cost of performance state, we would have said that my activity was here in New Hampshire. Under a market-based sourcing state, we say that my activity is in Massachusetts because that's where my customer is. So that change was effective for taxable periods ending on or after December 31st of 21. We have received and are analyzing calendar year returns, but have not yet received all fiscal year filers. So we'll have additional information on that when we come before the committees. Thank you. Another change, cap on credit carryovers. So um, a business um, from year to year can have a credit carryover. They may make estimate payments during the year, which are in excess of their liability. They have the opportunity at the end of the year to either have the excess refunded to them or to take it as a credit to carry over to future periods. For taxable periods ending on or after December 31st of 22, they cannot carry forward more than 500% of their taxable liability. That amount decreases to 250% for December 31st of 25 and 100% for December 31st of 27. What this means is that we could see increased refunds um, out of the business taxes. And that would start to happen with that 500% cap. That would be for returns for calendar year filers that we start receiving in March and April. So if a taxpayer has more than 500% um, in a, of their liability in a CCO, we will need to refund whatever is in excess of 500%. So that's something that we'll be watching closely um, as returns start to come in in March and April. Um, another change, single sales factor apportionment, that is a change for taxable periods on ending on or after December 31st of 22. Prior to um, taxable periods ending on or after December 31st of 22, again, this is an apportionment issue for taxpayers that operate in multiple states. If you operate in multiple states, historically, we would apportion your profits to New Hampshire based on your payroll, your property, and your sales. 
for December 31st, 22 forward, we're only going to apportion based on your sales. So if again, if you operate in New Hampshire and Massachusetts, we're gonna look at how much of your sales are in New Hampshire versus how much are in Massachusetts, and that's how we're gonna apportion your income and only tax your sales into New Hampshire. Those returns will start to be filed in March and April, and again, will be something that we will be watching. The next two bullets I won't read in detail. These are just changes to the filing threshold for BET and BPT. There, we're increasing the filing threshold, which means fewer returns will need to be filed. So um, for BPT, the filing threshold for taxable periods beginning January 1, 23, you will not need to file a return unless your gross in business income is in excess of $103,000. We will continue to adjust that amount biennially going forward based on CPI. And for BET, the filing threshold for taxable periods beginning January 1, 23 will be $281,000. Um, in gross business receipts or 281,000 of your enterprise value tax base. So again, the goal here is just to um, reduce the number of returns that need to be filed with us. It's better for small businesses, reduces um, the amount of work that's necessary at the DRA. And again, the thresholds will continue to adjust every other year going forward. Two last statutory changes to cover. First, um, net operating loss calculation will be apportioned only in the year of the loss for taxable periods beginning on or after December 31st, 22. Historically, the NOL would be apportioned in the year of the loss and in the year that the NOL was utilized, so it was apportioned twice. Now, with this single apportionment, um, there essentially will be more NOL available to businesses, so we will see a decrease in revenue as a result of this change. And then BBT um, rate reduces from 7.6 to 7.5 for taxable periods ending on or after December 31st of 23. Remember, this is only a BPT rate change. There was no bet rate change for this tax period. Okay, while we're on legislative changes, do yeah. we have any quick questions on those? Did you have any? Representative Almy? Well, a lot of these have a great deal of detail and purpose behind them, and I think we're going to have to get into them. Agreed. We can go over these in more detail in the committees, um, especially the changes to apportionment. Apportionment is complicated, um, so we will be available to the committee as much as necessary to make sure um, everyone feels like they at least have a minor understanding of, of some of the technical yeah. changes that have been made recently. We're happy but to do that. Follow up. Follow if up. I could just briefly, uh, in deference to Representative Major, who made this his the last ten years an uh, obsession, uh, the cap on the credit carry forward is Im really important. This committee did it, but it is really important to maintain some version of it because we owed, I think. Uh, 400 million? Mm, it got up over 300 million. Above yep. 300 million to uh, companies for credit that they kept on our books. And we have not accounted for that. And if they show up and ask for it back, uh, we've got a problem. So what we're trying to do is reduce it as much as we can each term. Uh, Representative, uh, excuse me, Senator Lang, sorry. <laughs> Either one works. Um, <clears throat> so just sticking with that topic of credit mm -hmm. carryover, I, I'm assuming as we go forward, you'll give us some estimates of what those refunds might look like in December 31st of 25 and, we and, will, and in 27, so we have an idea of that for yeah, the future. We, um, we did a fiscal note at the time. It, those were um, changes that I believe were in House Bill 2, um, but we can obviously update them. We'll have actuals once we start receiving the returns. So yes, we'll, we'll keep you updated on what we believe that impact to be. And in all reality, um, the, the, the impact can kind of happen in a couple ways. If a business is aware of it, they may choose to decrease their estimated payments and not necessarily be in a refund position. So it's a combination of potential of foregone revenue as opposed to having to issue a refund. And there may be a greater chance of the decrease in estimated payments, which would be foregone revenue, if we start to see an economic downturn or, or slowdown, businesses may say, hey, I'll, I'll keep my money and I'll use what I have on account. So 
we'll keep an eye on all of that and uh, we'll make sure we update you. Senator Rosenwald has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is not exactly related to the business taxes, but will um, DRA be able to um, update both the House and the Senate on the cost of not taxing the PPP loans and exactly what fiscal years those costs are going to fall in? The short answer is no. Oops. Um, mm -hmm. Because when we produced the fiscal note for those, for um, exempting PPP loans from gross income, there was guidance from the IRS at the time that was instructing businesses to um, assume that their loan would be forgiven. And therefore, we anticipated that businesses had paid in assuming New Hampshire's perspective and assuming that the loan would be forgiven. What actually ended up happening is they didn't do that. They waited for the loan to actually be forgiven. And by that point, our legislation had passed. So I think there were, you're probably remembering, there were pretty significant revenue est impacts to revenue that like we estimated at the time that really, I just don't think ever came to fruition. Ah, okay. So we're kind of, for lack of a better term, out of the woods on that one. Okay. Those changes are behind us, not something that we need to worry about. And I guess, fortunately, the impact didn't happen to the extent that we anticipated. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, madam. Okay. This is just a quick overview of business tax revenues for fiscal 2013 to 2022. Um, I would probably just bring your attention to the middle column, the change in revenue as a percent. You'll see the decrease of 11.9% in fiscal 20, and then an increase of 41.3 and 22.22%. Um, Business taxes can be volatile. Um, they're probably our hardest tax to estimate. Um, recent volatility really was kind of magnified by, by COVID um, and the uncertainty of businesses, but then the kind of the strong economy that seems to have come out of COVID. Um, fiscal year to date, we are 28.7% ahead of plan and 2.7% ahead of last year. So we may be seeing a little bit of a slowing in the growth of business taxes, um, but we'll talk about the timing of business taxes in just a couple of slides. So this was really just meant as a little bit of a history and to show you that business taxes can be volatile. Factors that contribute to business tax revenue. Um, overall, businesses continue to show strong financial performance. I think we all know in general, some businesses or some industries did better than others during COVID. I think we're fortunate here in New Hampshire that we have a fairly diverse tax base when it comes to the various industries that contribute to our business taxes. Um, certainly there are states that rely very heavily on tourism or very heavily on oil. Um, we have a diversity of businesses within the state, different industries. And so I think that kind of helped us weather the storm of COVID a little bit. If, if one industry like restaurants were, were struggling because they were closed, um, Another industry like retail sales, we're doing well. We have all of those industries here. And so we, we came out of COVID, I think, better than, than some of the other states. Factors that um, affect future business tax revenue, we talked about some statutory changes already. We'll cover that in greater detail when we're before the committees. The economy, um, supply chain constraints obviously continue to be kind of out there as a looming issue. Um, the inflation rate and that in impact on consumer spending. Low unemployment rate um, on one hand is good, but as Representative Almi alluded to earlier with restaurants, um, that can be bad if, if businesses can't find the staff um, to staff their businesses. That can also drive up labor costs. Future outlook, interest rate changes we talked about um, earlier, continued global geopolitical um, stability, economic uncertainty, these are all things that we're watching um, for what will come. I will let the people that are going to talk after me talk about what they anticipate to happen with the economy. Um, but 
you know, we will watch for some slowing or halting of growth. We will watch the unemployment rate, um, and then we'll see what happens generally um, as the economy moves forward. This is just a slide of the 10-year trend on business taxes, which I kind of already covered previously. This slide um, just gives you a breakdown of our business tax revenue. We receive revenue in a variety of ways. We receive it on tax notices, which is the teal color. We receive it on a return, which is blue. We receive revenue with extensions, which are green, which is where you pay your tax liability and we give you an extension for you to give us your full filled out return. We receive revenue and estimates in red and then we send out revenue in refunds in orange. What I want to just note here is that estimates are our largest source of revenue. Estimates are a half page sheet. It includes the taxpayer's name, identification number, and the amount of money that they're paying. So we have very little information on the majority of the revenue that we receive, which is why I point out at various times when we start receiving returns for certain statutory changes, because we don't know the information until that return is filed. If it is timely filed, it is three or four months after the end of the taxpayer's fiscal year. If it is on extension, you add seven months to that. So we're close to a year sometimes after the end of the taxpayer's year before we get all of the information that we need to tell you what's actually happening. So we do our best, but just know, unless there's a nice little love note with the estimate that tells me why they're, you know, doubled it or why they cut it in half, I don't know. <laughs> Senator Ling. Thank you. So. Uh, Commissioner, so uh, understanding, cause not again, we have a lot of freshmen. The estimates are based on the quarterly that they submit, right? So they anticipate the end of the year, I guess I'm going to have to pay 100 bucks. So I'm going to pay $25 every quarter until I hit my $100. Correct. But my liability might be more or less from that. Correct. And so there's penalties if you make an underestimate, you underpay your estimates, but there's a safe harbor if you pay an amount that's equal to 90% of your prior year. So as long as you're making estimates based on your prior year liability, you're percent essentially protected from any penalties if your estimates are not sufficient to cover your year-end liability. So which is why you will see that obviously we do get revenue that come in on extensions and returns because that's revenue that was not covered through the estimated payments. Um, but yes, in general, they estimate their liability, divide it by four, and send it to us four times a year. On page 28, this just very quickly breaks down revenue, um, estimate revenue, being our largest source, um, based on the, the type of entity. So fiduciaries, proprietorships, partnerships, and corporations. So you'll just see corporations contribute to the majority of the revenue that we receive. If anyone is familiar with the triangles that we kind of produce in our annual report, this is not news to you. But the majority of our revenue um, comes from corporations, in particular from your large multinational corporations that file what's called an 1120WE or Water's Edge return. Page 29 just is showing a breakdown between BPT and BET. Everything that I've covered up to this point has generally been the two taxes together. I think this is helpful to see, though, um, that historically BET and BPT have kind of tracked very similarly. In recent years, you'll see a pretty significant difference in the slope of the lines um, for BET and BPT. So really, this is just a result of profits. Profits are just growing at a higher rate um, in recent years, I think, as we all understand, than the bet um, taxable base. And then on page 30, just, I think, helpful to kind of see all of the taxes together. So you can see um, how the taxes have generally performed during COVID. Um, our taxes were generally flat or positive for most of the taxes. So as I said previously, we fared COVID pretty well. But at the bottom, it just kind of gives you an idea. You know, our business taxes are 1.2 billion and then going down to CST at 30 million. So just to give you some kind of perspective on which taxes are the largest that we collect. 
On page 31, um, Mr. Kane alluded to this, but what we've included here is um, our fiscal 23 tax revenues. So you can see what we collected in the first six months versus what the first six months plan was. So for business taxes, you'll see we're 28.7% ahead. I really wanna draw your attention to the last six months plan as a percent of total plan. So you'll see for business taxes, utility property tax, and communication service tax, we've collected roughly half of the revenue. It's pretty evenly spread throughout the year. Business taxes are shifted a little bit more toward the second half of the year with March um, and April returns estimates and then June estimates. You'll see for meals and rentals, tobacco, and the real estate transfer tax that we've likely already collected a little more than half of the revenue. And that's really due to some slowing in the winter months. Um, we talked about people maybe quitting smoking in the early part of the calendar year. Um, real estate transactions tend to be slower in winter months. Um, M&R, we can, you know, it's usually the summer and the fall that produce a little bit more of the revenue. The real focus, though, for IND, you'll see we're going to receive over 75% of the revenue in the second half of the year. That is through estimates that are due January 15th, returns in April, and then another round of estimates in June. So there's a ways to go with IND revenue. So I just put that out there in terms of timing. Um, it's, I wouldn't, especially with IND, I wouldn't draw too many conclusions based on where we are for the first half of the year just because there's so much revenue still to come in. And then the very last slide, just to be thorough, there are some other taxes that DRA administers that we didn't cover today. The Medicaid enhancement tax, um, the next thing to note about Medicaid enhancement tax is we have non-binding estimates that are due January 15th. We'll report to the committees based on what we receive of those non-binding estimates. We also administer the nursing facility quality assessment, the railroad tax and private car, the excavation tax and timber tax, also known as sticks and stones and the statewide education property tax. So just to dot all of our I's and cross all of our T's, I wanted to be thorough and list them all out. Wonderful, thank okay. you very much. That was a great overview. We will learn more. You will learn more. Do we have any final questions between, before we take a short break? Great, thank you again. Right. Thank you. Could you please maybe plan on January 23rd to come back and sure. see us? Okay. That's just for House Ways and Means. Okay. Okay, thank you. We'll take a break thank until you. 11, and then we will meet with the state treasurer. Thank you.
construction around the corner from Good morning, again. <clears throat> Good morning, Welcome to our state treasurer. Monica Mezzapelli, I hope I'm getting that right. You, you got it right. Thank Good. you. Excellent. Uh, our treasurer was elected during the joint session of the newly elected legislature uh, just recently to a second two-year term. And she uh, joined the state treasury in 2014, serving as deputy treasurer for nearly six years before being appointed commissioner. And she had, she's worked in the Legislative Budget Office as well. She was in the Audit Division since the year 2000. She is a certified public accountant and holds the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants designation of Chartered Global Management Accountant. So we welcome you here today. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you. Um, good morning, members of the committee. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here uh, this morning with all of you. Um, there's a lot to talk about, but I know we're going to focus on three, um, about three topics today. So I will start with um, 
I will start what we covered last year. Last year we were um, we were talking about uh, how we were recovering from um, the economic crisis that occurred during the pandemic. We had an extraordinary recovery. Um, revenues outperformed. Um, and we also were hearing about supply chain disruption, the imbalance of workforce. So all of those things were happening last year when we when I was with you before. And and so 2002 was another rocky year, right? We we um, it was the year of the inflation. It was um, uh, we continue to hear about workforce and 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 again inflation. It was it is a global phenomenon. So. Um, what happened in 2002 is um, all the central banks around the world um, started increasing rates. So that really was what um, caused a lot of um, disruption in 2022. So we had um, um, a stock market that didn't like that. We had the worst performance since 2008, uh, since the Great Recession. The bond market uh, had the worst performance um, in history, so they did not like to see that um, high inflation in seeing how the central banks were trying to combat um, that, um, you know, that new condition in the economy. So, so with that, I will start with just you know discussing what we will cover today. Um, and again, we're going to talk about the state's financial condition. Um, talk a little bit about our cash flows and reserves and our debt, our bonds, and our ratings. Um, so I wrote, we can do questions and answers at the end, but obviously I can be interrupted anytime. Um, so all of you know what my office does. So we are a, a nonpartisan constitutional office. Um, we are responsible for the cash investments and um, the issuance of our general obligation bonds, our revenue bonds, and all the finance and activities that the state um, is, you know, engages uh, in. And as part of that, we also have all the responsibilities. We manage the claim property program. We receive about, I will say, about twenty million dollars from um, holders, from property holders, each year, and we return about. Um, between six and seven million each year to the rightful owners of that property. So last year we created about 15 million to the general fund. So that's about the amount that we credit each year. Um, we also responsible for the 529 College Savings um, program that continues to be a successful program in the state, helping families save for college. Right now we have about 21 billion in assets under management. Again, a very successful program, and that is. Um, um, we have that administration with the College Tuition Savings Plan Advisory Commission. And a similar program that we have as a smaller and at a, at a smaller scale is the Achieving a Better Life Experience uh, ABLE Savings Program. So it is a similar savings plan for individuals and families with disabilities. So that program is growing. I, I have that co-administration with the Governance Commission on Disability and Right now we have 6.4 million in assets under management and about 800 accounts. So that is, um, again, I think families are realizing what the benefits of the program are and they're taking advantage of that. And as all of you know, um, I serve on many mul multiple boards and commissions. So we just essentially have our hands everywhere in the state. So, um, the good news is that in fiscal year 22, uh, we had a, a, another remarkable year in terms of, of performance. We we continue to, um, you know, we continue that trend as you heard from Commissioner uh, Step. Uh, revenues outperform again in fiscal year 22. Um, again, we just continue to see, we, we just um, continue to see that uh, the recovery from the pandemic, you know, caused by, you know, all of the various factors that really. Uh, occurred as you know, everyone was trying to um, um, imp uh, improve the economy in 2021 between monetary policy, fiscal policy, uh, all of that came together and all of the states benefited from, from that. So we obviously the state um, did really well and so we had a restricted revenue of about $3.2 uh, billion and that was uh, $435.5 above 
plan, so about 15.6%. So I know you heard from Commissioner Sepp all of the, the performance of individual taxes, so right now I'm going to focus on unrestricted revenue um, so we can see um, um, you know, how the state uh, performed. And, and again, all of this is, is information you already know. I'm, I'm just simply recapping what was reported in the annual comprehensive financial report, and that's um, in the next three slides. Um, so, so with that additional revenue that was above plan, of course, all you know that you took advantage of that, and uh, there were additional appropriations um, that were um, above and beyond what was uh, budgeted for fiscal year 22 and 23. Uh, there was about 140 million uh, designated for fiscal year 22, and about 175 million for fiscal year 23. I might have this 175 million, um, not 100 percent. That's an, um, an exact or estimate, but that's what I have from my records. Um, perhaps you heard from um, LBA and Mr. Kane, you know, what that amount was. Um, but with that, um, you know, we had um, the General Education Trust Fund had an undesignated balance, so what we call surplus of uh, $361 million, and from that it was uh, $253.3 million relative to general fund and $108 million relative to the Education Trust Fund. And so the um, the revenue stabilization account or rainy day fund finished the year with 159 point million, and that compares to 257.8 million that we had in fiscal year 22. So we added 2.1 million of legal settlement funds, and also 100 million was appropriated to the YDC settlement funds. So again, this is information that you already know. And the next page is how it's um, presented in the in the act for the fiscal year 22. Um, I just I'm including the table how it's presented, and again it just shows um, how the um, unrestricted revenue for fiscal year 22, um, how um, it, it includes the appropriations, it includes um, lapses in fiscal year 22 of about 104 million. And um, again, the undesignated fund balance all the way down is uh, 253 million for the general fund, 108 for the education fund, and 361.3 million in total. And it shows again the activity for the rainy day fund. What I believe the controller's office wanted to show in this case, even though the 100 million that is designated for the YDC settlement fund that's applicable for fiscal year 23. Um, I know the com controller's office wanted to show that in, in, our, in the act for so it's separated that 100 million separately from the rainy day fund. So um, again, we now see, and we're going to talk about the rainy day fund a little later in the presentation, but that is um, what is presented in the act for. The, the next page is also a piece. Uh, this is a table that is also included in the act for, and this is how the controller's office was trying to. Um, I guess, uh, percent the additional appropriations that happened um, that were in addition to the budget. Um, so this table shows what was approved in House Bill 1 and House Bill 2. Then again, those um, appropriations designated for fiscal year 22 is $140 million for the general fund. Um, and then it's, it also shows a few, um, I guess, adjustments, and something that caught my attention was um, some of those um, 105 million was um, that was designated for fiscal year 22. Agencies are moving it to fiscal year 23, um, it, so that must that must be encumbrances in, in all the transfers of appropriations. But what I wanted to show you with my 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 uh, my arrows, hopefully I was successful with that. This total um, of 208, um, not 200, um, 2.8 billion is what is the amount that is in the table above that blue arrow there. It's just showing essentially all of the total appropriations and between those um, appropriations minus the lapses, it gives you what is being presented as total net appropriations. Hopefully I'm not confusing anybody, but Again, an extraordinary year in fiscal year 22, and that's what is being shown in this table. So 
So this is just a trend of unrestricted revenue. Um, you can see how this spend, this has, um, unrestricted revenue has been um, increasing, increasing over time with a few exceptions. Obviously we can see um, you know, the performance in 2020, there was a, a decl decline in performance, but this, I just wanted to show you the 10 year trend in this, in this graph. This uh, next graph, I, I, I like to look at this graph just because it shows the performance um, and the revenue growth, and the revenue growth over time. And I like to, I've been compiling data now, and, and this shows um, the, the performance since 2007. And as you can see how um, the peaks, that um, decline in peaks, it just shows um, how during those economic downturns, we, we had that, um, significant declines in, in 2009, we have negative 7%. Um, in 2020, we had negative 6%. Um, the other one anomaly that is, is, is presented here is really in 2004 when um, the revenue that we as, was being presented as unrestricted at that moment, which is the Medicaid enhancement tax, was changed and it was recharacterized as restricted revenue. So since then it's been considered restricted revenue, but again, the performance is just shows how, um, how the state has performed over time. So a compound annual growth rate of 2.1% since 2007. Um, again, there's so much in this data. It could be, again, we have a combination of um, economic downturns, um, Tax, change, tax changes, at, um, reductions in some taxes. So it's really, um, perhaps there's a lot to analyze here, but it just shows how that uh, performance has occurred over time. Um, and of course we have that peak in 2021 that shows 21% uh, revenue growth, which is uh, incredible. Um, then again, in, 2000, in fiscal year 22, we had an 8% um, growth uh, over the prior year. And then in fiscal year 23, based on what the revenue um, fiscal year to date, it looks like we are, um, revenue is above plan, about 22%, uh, and it's 3.5% uh, over the prior year. So again, another, um, again, fiscal year 22 was a strong year. Um, fiscal year 23, it looks like, fiscal year 23, it looks like it's, um, um, we are, um, in a strong position to perhaps face a potential recession. So this is not an economic update, and I, but I just wanted to include a few uh, a few economic indicators just to give you a background of where things have been and how you know the decisions that have been made by central banks. Um, the the Federal Reserve has two mandates. One is price stability. The other one is. Uh, full employment. So because of that, uh, they're looking at a variety of economic factors and um, unemployment rate has been strong, as, as you all know, and especially in New Hampshire, we have a 2.6% rate. And I know you're gonna hear from experts about um, how the economy has been and where it's going. Um, but this is just to give you an indication that unemployment rate and, and labor participation has been strong, the Federal Reserve's um, they, they continue to watch that activity, but they feel comfortable with that piece. The piece that obviously they're not comfortable with is the inflation and how inflation has changed since um, 2021. And we can see that in December of 22, we had inflation of 7%. In the beginning, the Federal Reserve was discussing the fact that it was a, a it, the inflation was transitory. Well, at the end of last year, they started removing that, that term and, and, and really start worrying about inflation, a sticky inflation. And so we saw in 22 how uh, inflation continued in the last, um, uh, and so in, in that's when the Federal Reserve started increasing rates. So in March of uh, 22, the Federal Reserve started increasing rates for the first time. And after that, increased rates seven times, and they've been very aggressive with that. Um, it appears that what they're doing, they're also trying to uh, remove the size of the balance sheet. So all of the pieces, the, the, poli the monetary policy policy appears to be working. Um, inflation is starting to come down. And um, again, we know how all of this is started. Uh, obviously the, the, the fact that we have a war in Ukraine um, 
impacted uh, energy prices and it impacted um, uh, f food prices. So all of that is is is, is starting to um, um, balance a little better. Um, and again, obviously, this is 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 not clear whether inflation is gonna um, if it's gonna continue to decline. But again, this is this is this, this are the um, factors that the it, everyone is is really watching. Um, so, Madam Treasurer, could we interrupt for just one moment for a quick question while we're on this slide? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Representative Schamburg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Treasurer. Uh, how quickly are you informed when the Federal Reserve makes their decision to either raise or lower interest rates so you can do our policy here in this state? Uh, we we we're, we're very aware of what what is happening um, all the time. I mean, it, it, it's just not, and we'll I'll talk about in a, about that in a minute. Um, do you prefer I wait? Okay, okay, sounds good. And then hopefully, if that doesn't answer your question, I'll we can go back to that. Perfect. So 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 that brings me to the next slide. Really, um, um, for anyone who is um, not familiar with the with this, um, the U.S. Uh, Treasury yield curve, perhaps um, this is this is, the the U.S. Treasury yield curve. It just um, shows what um, is is really uh, um, a representation of how rates are short term to long term, and this is something uh, the financial markets, uh, investors, and everyone is is watching. So this is how uh, investors are feeling the 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 environment right now. So. Um, with the with the changes in the with the changes that the Federal Reserve has in, been making, um, I guess I'll pause for a moment. Um, I just want to um, I guess try to explain the chart. Um, if you look at the um, the dotted line, the blue dotted line, um, that represents the normal yield curve, and what that shows is that it shows um, short-term rates are lower than the than the uh, long-term rates. Uh, obviously, if you are investing in short-term, you're expected to be, if you're, if you're investing long-term, you're expected to be compensated at a higher yield when you invest for a longer period of time. So this is what the normal yield curve will show. But what's been happening with the, with the uh, changes in, in rates is, as the Federal Reserve is increasing rates, the, U, the, the yield curve is changing, so it's putting all the pressure at the front end of the curve. And as you can see, the, the, blue, the blue line that is the activity at December 31st of 2022, you can see how the higher rates are at the front end of the curve, and they are um, changing, and at the long term, they're lower. Um, and so, 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 so again, what, what the Federal Reserve has been doing, uh, reducing the size of their balance sheet and increasing rates, is just changing how this curve is, is, is being presented. And one of the things that, that is interest, interest, very interesting is how, um, how the front end, and even when you see that the two-year two yield and the, is higher than the 10-year yield, that typically represents um, or it is an indication of a recession. So the markets have been predicting this. So and it's called the um, it's called the, um, that the, the the yield curve has inverted. So the yield curve inverted for the first time in April of 22, and then it inverted again in July of 22. So since then, the markets have been predicting this rece potential recession, and that typically happens between six and 12 months. Um, but again, that could change. You know, the, as 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 new economic data um, um, changes and 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 it's available to investors in the Federal Reserve, obviously that that performance can change. But this is just an indication of how things have changed since last year and what the yield curve looks like right now. And that is, um, and so we're we're aware of. So the markets continue, continuously talk about this. They're constantly discussing. Well, what is the Federal Reserve going to do? So right now, there's expectation that the Federal Reserve will continue to raise rates. Um, they've been very aggressive in the very beginning, but now they're expecting to perhaps slow down for the rest of the year. Um, and um, but but they're but they're expected to continue to raise the rates until they feel that they've 
tackle the inflation because their target, their, their target is to bring inflation down to 2%. Um, so this is, this is what the market, the bond market investors are seeing. This is the, they see that in the long term, rates are gonna be about 3.96%, 4% range. And this is what the market predicting. They're predicting a recession over the next six to 12 months again. It's hard to know, but that's the picture that we are all uh, monitoring at this point. The next chart is what the Federal Reserve is thinking. So every time they meet, they make decisions and um, every quarter they update their economic um, projections. So this is a chart that shows how they see rates over the next few years. So based on their information, the economic data that they captured, um, they believe the inflation is gonna go down but they believe that they're gonna to continue to increase rates. So the medium, the, the, the solid line here shows the medium, and this is when the Federal Reserve meets, they all discuss um, where they think rates are going to be. So in 23, they expect that the rate is gonna have a terminal rate of 5.1% in 23. They expect right now that um, in 24, they're gonna be about 4.1%. Uh, in 25, they're gonna be about 3.1% and then just lower over time in about um, three, three and a half percent. So there's a difference between what the Fed is thinking and what the bond market or what the investors are thinking. As you can see, the, the investors think, well, it's gonna be, long term is gonna be about 4% in the long run. The Federal Reserve is thinking less. There is uh, obviously that debate that they will have to decide <laughs> or just over time we'll know what really will happen. Um, but this is just an indication of what we are seeing and how we are, um, again, based on this information, how we're planning our, our how we see the economy will go based on um, interest rates. So with that in the background, I wanna talk about cash flows and our reserves. Um, so the good news is our cash position and our reserves are very strong. Um, as you all know, our cash position changed dramatically over the last two years. Um, between revenue performance and then um, because of all the stimulus money that we received over the last um, two years, um, we have a position right now of about, we went from uh, between 200 and 800 million of daily um, administration of cash to about 2.5 million in fiscal year 22. Right now we're about two, two billion, I keep saying billion, mixing the millions and the billions. It's about two, five, $2.5 billion. So at the end of fiscal year 22, um, all, all funds combined, we had about $3 billion in, um, in our banks. So during fiscal year 22, we processed um, about $9.3 billion in deposits, and we dispersed about $8.4 billion in payments. And so as all you know, we, we also have um, some trust in custodial accounts, and that in the aggregate is about $58 million that was um, the balance at the end of fiscal year 22. Excuse so us, could we ask you a quick question while we're here? And then I also need to manage the timeline. I know, I'm so <laughs> sorry. So we only have about five minutes left because we have never pr another presenter behind you. But of course, we welcome you back to Ways and Means very soon to go over this in even more detail. But Representative Plett has a question. Yeah, is there a typo? It says of June 30th, 2023, cash is $3 billion. How do you know what is June 30th, 2023? It's only January. I'm sorry, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure where. The previous slide. Where we are. Cash flow and reserves, uh, the fourth bullet. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, you're, you're right. It's, it should be 22. And I apologize for not managing my time. Um, I could, um, um, what I'll do is um, just mention um, the highlights. Um, this, um, because of our cash position has been very strong, um, we have, um, we have in, we've been investing our funds um, in, I guess I'll move to um, this slide um, 
this is what our cash flows um, look like right now. Again, we went from lower levels to right now it's about um, $2 billion. And I'll stick with the charts. This chart is how um, we've been. Um, so again, since we, we our, our cash position changed dramatically over time, we we redefine and we refine our, our investment policy. And so we are exploring um, different investments now that would allow us to maximize um, um, the, the amount of cash we have in our res in in our ex what we call excess cash, not not uh, not our reserves. So our reserves is what we will call it our rainy day fund. So um, in terms of what um, in terms of the rainy day fund, we have about one hundred fifty nine point nine mi um, million in our reserves. As you all know, um, that has been that has increased over time, and 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 it is, so it's a strong it's a strong um, it's a strong number. And even though 100 million was taken from um, last year, we obviously continue to have a strong reserve uh, in our in our in our um, for the state. So one thing I want to point out as um, um, this this particular slide talks about the the maximum amount that we can hold, and and um, one way to look at that is right now we we hold about. 47% of what we are allowed to hold in a rainy day fund, 10% um, of the total revenues is what we can hold for the for the biennium is as much as we can hold. We hold about 47%. Um, but again, one way to uh, another way to look at that is how you know how much money we have in our reserves of our, our reserves, and how the state will be able to uh, cover expenses if we only had those reserves to 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 continue. Um, uh, operating. So another way to look at that is the number of days that um, we could cover our expenditures with the amount that we have in our reserves. So this, uh, there's a research study done by Pew Charitable Trust, and um, they're saying that the median is about uh, 42.5 days. And we have, you know, if you want to cover the rain, um, the general funds, we, we could cover about 36 point, um, 36.3 days, and in order to cover both the general fund and, expend and, and, and education trust fund expenditures, we will cover about 21.6 uh, days of expenditure. So again, it's just a quick, another way to look at our rainy day fund. And um, again, we're investing in our rainy day fund in, in, in a different way. We just developed a, 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 an investment policy for this now that we have a lot more funds in there. We're trying to take advantage of we're so the so we we have a very similar investment policy than we have for operating funds, uh, which is preservation of capital, liquidity, and in and, and we obviously want to maximize the rate of return. The difference between the rainy day fund and our operating funds is that um, we expect to have the rainy day fund amount the reserves longer in there, and so the weighted average maturity of our securities obviously are longer than one year. So, so there's a lot to, to discuss about interest. As you all heard, you know, the interest rates, the good news is that interest rates are, are, are higher. And with that amount of cash that we have right now, we are earning interest for the first time. So we recorded interest in fiscal year 22 about only 3 million. Um, fiscal year today, we have recorded about 17 million and we expect to at least have double the amount by the end of the fiscal year we still need to refine our estimates but that's what it looks like so obviously um the rest of the other two the biennium of uh, fiscal year 24 and 25 will depend on the average um balance and of our cash so uh, but again you you've been hearing about the yields how perhaps those yields are going to be over the next two years um so we will have inter interest income for some time Um, our debt has been decreasing over time. That's that's good news. We have our outstanding debt. We've been paying that debt. Um, um, again, the trend has been uh, declining. Um, the general obligation bonds are, um, again, declining. Turnpikes doesn't have. Um, they did a refunding this year. They, they haven't had a need to issue more bonds. And then the other, um, the Garvey is is another. Um, uh, type of bond that we've just been paying 
uh, the debt service on that. And again, it, it's been declining. Um, we are right now trying to um, try to uh, determine how much money we're going to issue for bonds this year. Um, one key component of that is we typically issue bonds based on capital expenditures. Well, capital expenditures have been declining because of all the delays in projects. So perhaps we're going to issue less bonds and we're trying to uh, determine uh, obviously the amount. But over the last two years, those capital expenditures have been again, declining because of all the delays. And we issued a small amount in 2020. We didn't issue in 21. We issued about, um, what did I say, 59 million in, um, in 22. And right now expenditures, what we see for capital expenditures are very low. So we ex if we issue debt this year, it's gonna be a very small amount, but... Um, And our ratings, so I just want to jump to the ratings. Um, so um, the good news, we have very strong ratings, credit ratings, and um, Moody's and Fitch have affirmed the rate, and so we, we have a strong rate with, with them. Um, last year, um, S&P um, Global Ratings um, changed the outlook for the stay from stable to positive, and that's because obviously the economy, our, our, our financials have been very strong. Um, they obviously have been observing the activity, uh, our, our revenues have performed. Um, they love the idea that we increase the capacity for the rainy day fund. They love the idea that we added more money to the rainy day fund. Um, so their, um, the outlook for the state changed from stable to positive. So that's an indication that perhaps they're considering an upgrade for us. Um, so that would be wonderful news. But obviously they'll continue to monitor that activity uh, for the state. And um, obviously the rating, the, um, the rating agencies are, um, in addition to look at all our I'll go back to one slide for a moment. Um, in addition to looking at, you know, the, 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 the obviously they look at our rainy day fund balances and, and, and levels. Um, they, you know, New Hampshire has always been able to obviously to balance the budget. They, they, they review the levels of Medicaid expenditure, how that increases, um, how that provides, um, or causes budgetary pressures, the levels of funding of the pension and the OPEV liabilities, obviously they are concerned about that. Um, they also like to see, um, you know, our ability to manage our revenues, our expenditures, and reserves. So the flexibility that the state will have. But again, we've received uh, what we call uh, credit positive, and so again, that's the reason that we've been have we continue to have an excellent rate. Uh, something that they're watching, something to watch is obviously their uh, rating agencies are watching macroeconomic conditions, um, how we're going to respond to this lower economy, how we're going to respond to this sticky inflation, perhaps higher borrowing cost. Um, and, you know, other factors that they review is how the Sydney Hampshire, for example, is going to manage additional funding that is going to be for infrastructure, is, is how the state is um, taking advantage of that additional funding and, and how that will benefit our state and how we're going to take advantage of all of that. Um, how the state manages additional risk, you know, new threats, cybersecurity um, risks, as, as I mentioned at that last time we met. Um, New risks, you know, cyber, uh, cryptocurrency, how we are responding to regulation relative to that, and, and how we're responding to extreme weather. You know, what are the measures that will provide cl climate resilience? Um, so, so with that, I think that ends my presentation. I went through it very quickly. Uh, but with that, um, just so when I mention um, S&P, for example, foresees a recession, a shallow recession, and they believe in general that um, public finance or states are going to be able to weather that because of the strong strong economy that we've had and the financial conditions that we currently have. Um, so it's, yeah, that yet to see. So apologies for the time, um, but but thank you for, for having me, and I'll be happy to answer any questions if there's time for that. Thank you so much. Are there any very quick questions? Representative Almi. Thank you. On, I know some a number of the things that where we're compared with other states only look at our general fund. Do the credit agencies also look at our education trust fund and the highway fund? 
to a lesser extent, um, they do. I mean, they know that the the the, the revenue is restricted to the, the revenue that is um, for the education trust fund is restricted for that purpose. So what they really review is our you know flexible and restricted revenue, and and so how that increases, and because obviously that provides greater flexibility for the state, for again all of those pieces that could create budgetary pressures. They're constantly worried about, well, how the state's responding to those changes, emergencies, um, new programs, you know, are you, are, you, are you generating enough revenue to, to, to pay for those new programs and new initiatives and things like that? Could, could I just, I didn't Quick quite follow. understand. So the Education Trust Fund, even though we can take money out of it and put money into it, uh, from the general fund is not considered while they're looking at this? They do look at it. It's just okay. it's just considered restricted. And so, again, they pay more attention to the unrestricted portion, uh, what is called the net tax. Again, this they look at the ability for issuers of bonds to be able to pay debt service. You, you know, this is, this is a credit... Um, a credit rating that is presented to investors. So our ability to generate revenues, our ability to pay our net tax supported debt, uh, those are the things that they pay close attention to. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Lake? That wasn't a question, just a comment of some of the members. So one of the things she talked, uh, the treasurer talked about was a $100 million withdrawal from the rainy day fund. Well, at the same time, we're talking about how great the revenue is doing, and we're making all kinds of money across all of our tax revenues. And I just wanted to remind, especially the freshmen, that $100 million was for the Sununu Center. It was an offset to put aside for the lawsuit against the Sununu Center and all those cases. And so we withdrew from the rainy day fund $100 million and set it aside to deal with any of those lawsuits. So just you didn't think we took money out because it was raining. Um, it was just a potential rainstorm that was coming, and we set it aside and planned for it. Just quickly to add to that, I mean, to take the time, but um, that is something I had to have a conversation with the rating agencies, and, and they, I did explain to them it was, it was, it was a rainy day. Um, but obviously the question that came back um, to, to me, to us, to all of us is, what is the state, what are the, state, what are the plans to replenish that amount? If there's a plan to replenish, obviously they're interested in increasing our reserves because it's a way for them to, to see how New Hampshire is gonna respond to a potential recession. So the more money we have in our reserves and our cash position, um, the better prepared we're gonna be to face uh, or mitigate a recession. We will be more competitive and attractive than the neighboring states, is that's how we're going to do it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Speaking of being better economically than our neighboring states, we have to rec uh, recognize, I hope he's here, Commissioner Caswell, there he is. <laughs> Taylor Caswell is the first commissioner of the New Hampshire Department of Business and Economic Affairs. He was the first appointed by the governor uh, in the position in 2017. And he serves as the chief economic and marketing official for the state and oversees the state divisions of economic development and travel and tourism. Mr. Caswell's experience in the private sector includes structuring and funding renewable power and affordable housing development, financial services, and government relations for a Fortune 500 energy company. And he grew up in Littleton, where he founded uh, the Parker Mountain Trails and does a lot of mountain Still biking. Still live in Littleton. Fabulous. <laughs> so there's probably a lot more here, but welcome. Great. Thank you, uh, Representative. And it's good to see everybody. It's nice to be back in person. Uh, for this conversation. Uh, what I wanted to do today was sort of set the stage, I think, maybe for um, uh, where we are strategically and on a big picture uh, with the state economy and what we are doing at my department in coordination with others across the state sort of facilitate the advancement of our uh, competitive advantages in New Hampshire, as you so aptly put it. Um, so just real quickly, uh, I mean, and I know you're going to hear from uh, my friends Rich Lavers and uh, Brian Gottlob and Ken Johnson after after uh, the lunch hour. Um, they will be able to provide you a good deal of granular data around all the sort of subjects that 
uh, I'm going to discuss with you briefly here this morning. Um, but just as a quick overview, for those of you who are maybe new to the committee, our department, uh, as Representative Sanborn pointed out, uh, is the uh, chief marketing organization. So uh, that explains maybe some of our flashy slides. We have a lot of creative uh, materials to use for those sorts of things. Um, but we do uh, all the state's marketing uh, around tourism, hospitality, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But we also have the Division of Economic Development. And this is a larger organization within the department that is focused heavily on business retention, business recruitment. We handle the international relations for the state. Uh, we have uh, our Office of Workforce Opportunity, which works on the uh, workforce development uh, end of things and uh, and a few other entities within BEA that all together have been uh, our own entity since 2017. So uh, a lot of these functions were handled individually at the former De Department of Revenue and Economic, or not Revenue, Department of Resource and Economic Development, formerly known as DREAD. Uh, we've been in, in, in uh, uh, our role here since 2017. So I would say just the, just kind of headline here, the top two challenges that we're facing from a policy standpoint and from an economic standpoint in the state remain workforce and, uh, and housing. So those are two areas that I'm going to focus a little bit on today. And then again, uh, you'll be able to hear some more about the different uh, components of that and how they all go together uh, uh, after lunch. So this is a very basic slide of the unemployment rate. I put this here really because it's a good uh, measure. There's obviously a lot more to uh, analyzing uh, the health of the economy. Uh, but this one, I think, really sort of demonstrates for us, at least uh, on a standard that we see across a multitude of different states and across the United States, that New Hampshire remains highly competitive from a, from a, from a standpoint of available workforce. And when we work with companies and we work with uh, companies that are either looking to expand here or looking to move here, uh, this is the first question we get. Um, what about the workforce and how are we going to be able to uh, access a workforce for the work that we're doing? Uh, and that is uh, something that we uh, obviously work very closely with partners of the university system and community college system and with New Hampshire Employment Services and others sort of make those components go together for the employers that we're working with. The other, as I mentioned, and something that I'll, I'll talk a little bit more in detail about uh, in a minute or two is uh, is the housing situation. This is a map that shows uh, from New Hampshire uh, Housing Finance Authority um, uh, where things stand as far as uh, rental metrics in the state. And you know, we're at a 1500 per month median gross rent. We have a 0.3 and in some cases even lower than that vacancy rate for uh, housing units uh, across the state. Uh, this is remains uh, our number one challenge in my view, because when we start talking about what are the issues around workforce, uh, we have jobs, we have people to fill those jobs in a lot of places. We have access to people who want to live here and take advantage of these jobs. We see data that supports all of that. And it is uh, uh, the on the ground sort of experience of our staff that we are seeing that if we don't have places for people to live uh, and we don't have uh, adequate sort of steps of people places for people to live so in other words uh, come in looking for an efficiency apartment maybe move to a two-bedroom three-bedroom and then buy a house all of those markets uh, are seeing uh, a real challenge and they continue to see that challenge uh, nothing new we've been facing this for some time but it is definitely accelerated and it's a lot more obvious uh, in the environment that we're in right now and i would also point out of course that we are not the only state facing this challenge but when people say that to me, I say, well, then that means that we need to solve it faster than anyone else. Um, and I'll talk some more about those uh, two issues in a moment. Um, tourism, uh, another major function of our department. Uh, we have been, since uh, we were established back in 2017, really working to um, integrate the messaging that we do for tourism with the work that we do to uh, attract workforce and attract businesses to New Hampshire. Uh, a lot of the quality of life components that we all know and love here are things that are very appealing to all of those audiences. And in fact, in a lot of the research that we do, we, it does, we do see a very common um, representation of having access 
to uh, the quality of life and the outdoor activities as being a major driver for people who either want to visit here for a weekend or people who want to move here or start a business here or move their business here. Uh, it is a common uh, a strategy that we have really tried to accelerate over the last few years, and I think to some success. Uh, we do see increases in numbers of people that have come to the state, uh, that are looking to come to the state. Uh, we can demonstrate that in net migration numbers that over the last five years have seen increases for New Hampshire, particularly in younger demographics. Uh, Mr. Johnson will probably be able to speak to you a little bit about that a little later uh, today. Um, but we do uh, really work hard to make those pieces all flow together while also supporting our very important tourism industry. Uh, the other, only other point I would make on this slide is uh, we do calculate the return on investment that we make with the marketing re uh, funds that we do receive from the legislature. Uh, we are currently somewhere between 14 and $15 returned uh, to the state in terms of meals and uh, rentals revenue for every dollar that we spend in our marketing budgets. Um, but, you know, I, I said the last thing, second to last thing on this really is also that uh, we have been using this strategy for many years. And in fact, you could go back uh, many years in New Hampshire's history and see that using tourism and using the outdoor activities as a marketing strategy, not just for uh, tourism, but also for the wider aspects of our economy is nothing terribly new. But I would say that we are seeing a, a, a much larger audience that is receptive to this message after the experience of COVID. Uh, we have a lot of uh, individuals and families that are in urban areas, particularly in the Northeast, that are seeing uh, the value of quality of life and they are looking at New Hampshire uh, as an opportunity for them. And of course, this ties back to the issues that we spoke about earlier, but uh, that uh, continues to be uh, something that we can demonstrate that we're seeing progress. Uh, another very simple just sort of overview of uh, the change in visitation versus 2021 and spend rates. You see fall really continues to be a very, uh, a very uh, important season for the state of New Hampshire. Um, we see this in uh, both drive markets, but also in, in uh, international and long haul markets from areas like Texas and Florida. Uh, people come for a short, a very focused period of time. I, uh, Winter is a very uh, weather-dependent um, um, uh, industry, as we're experiencing this year. And then the spring and summer numbers. The summer numbers are a little lower this year. That's not that unusual. We see a very consistent number in our in our in our summer numbers, and we had a huge bump in twenty in twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one, which is uh, reflected that uh, here in this number, that twenty twenty two, we saw those numbers starting to return a little bit more towards a normal visitation statistic. And this I put here just for uh, this was our projection that we've made for uh, this current season that we're in. Uh, of course, we had this projection was done um, with some variables related to weather, but uh, the the lack of snow, particularly in the extreme north country, um, has, has been a challenge thus far this year. Uh, the snowmobiling industry in particular, not seeing a lot of um, product to be able to ride on. Uh, although I would say uh, for anyone who's watching, uh, the ski areas are doing fine. They are able to make a lot of snow, and it's uh, very worth uh, coming to New Hampshire for the long weekend and maybe getting in some skiing. I'm contractually obligated to say that. Um, I wanted to uh, quickly run through an overview here. This is something that I'm happy, you know, and some of you have seen me talk about this before, and it's something we'll continue to talk about as we go through the session, but our economic recovery and expansion strategy, this was something that we put together late 2020, early 21. We're still operating from this. Uh, it's designed, obviously, in, 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 in light of the pandemic to be a strategy that recognizes that the world of economic development and community development feels very different than it did uh, in 2019. And so we've been trying really hard to stay ahead of the curve, uh, using components of this strategy to make investments and in design programs that give New Hampshire that competitive advantage over the states that we compete with for economic investment. The five major goals, this is very high level. This is all on a website. Um, 
uh, and something that has a lot of backup material in it. If you're interested in looking at that, uh, some of these are, are pretty obvious. And I've talked about almost all of these here, recruiting and uh, retaining amount the workforce, the connection of tourism to recruitment, uh, building resiliency in our high growth sectors. High growth right now sectors are, uh, there are several, but uh, life science, health uh, care, manufacturing, uh, tourism continues to be in that space. Uh, advanced manufacturing, and so on. Those are areas that uh, we continue to see uh, growth, but also potential for additional investment, uh, which those two together it, uh, really kind of forms what, we, what we're most interested in uh, working and, and, and uh, focusing on, I should say. Uh, entrepreneurship, and then the infrastructure piece, I would also point out here, uh, that isn't just roads and bridges, that's things like broadband. Uh, and the ability to have a state that has access to high-speed internet in the 21st century, uh, now that we're, what, 20% through it, uh, it remains a really critical component to the overall recruitment and retention strategies. Uh, as anyone will tell you, we're working on people working remotely, people being able to live in a small town and work for uh, a firm that might not have a huge presence in New Hampshire, but they're getting paid. Uh, by that firm and they're spending that money in a local community. Uh, these are all things that uh, are necessary and are part of what I was saying earlier about that, uh, what looks different about economic and community development in New Hampshire after the pandemic, that certainly is one of them. When we start to take those things, uh, those five key areas, and we break them down into the functions that the department really sort of works with our collaborative partners to uh, to to, to uh, advance those initiatives, these are the eight areas that, again, guide uh, where we go with those sort of things. And I, I know we're short on time, so I'm not going to go through all of these uh, independently. Uh, again, I've spoken to most of these, um, and there are areas where we must have uh, relationships and collaborations both with our fellow state agencies but with local and regional officials municipalities uh, and with other economic development organizations around the state and one of the ways that we do that which is part of this economic strategy are what we call collaborative economic development regions uh, we have four of these across the state we've developed these over the last couple of years they are forums for all of those partners that i just mentioned to take part and contribute and help us regionalize a lot of those uh, five uh, high level strategies that we mentioned earlier and put um, actionable strategies into place uh, this has been a huge benefit to us to be able to uh, effectively leverage the uh, the ability for the state to give uh, support to this type of activity, to take some common strategies and say, we feel pretty strongly that we need to go through that door, not that door for right now. But when we get on the other side of that door, things might look different in the North Country than they do on the seacoast. So we want to be able to regionalize some of the activity that we do. Uh, and uh, give those strategies a flavor that actually has an applicability and a value to employers and organizations in that region. So the CEDARS are a big function of that. Uh, this slide gives a little more detail, I guess, in terms of what we actually do with them. Uh, uh, they have received some uh, resources from us to be able to advance some specific initiatives in their areas. Uh, and this has been, I, I can't emphasize this enough, because one of the things that was missing from New Hampshire for many years was what I refer to as the economic development infrastructure for the state. The systems that are in place to be able to advance common initiatives and strategies that make sense that the state is seeing a value based in data, based in uh, not somebody just sort of picking something and throwing a dart against the wall, but these are high, tr high value targets, high value strategies. And then to have the, uh, the support of organizations like regional development corporations or planning commissions or local municipalities that have economic development offices, getting and chambers of commerce, getting these organizations to all sort of see a common vision and be able to look towards ways to make uh, those things happen in their own way has been a big success. And I think it will continue to be, particularly if we end up moving in a, in a downtrend in our economy. Uh, I was obviously going to mention uh, the program that we uh, started earlier, uh, mid-year last year, the Invest NH housing program. 
Uh, this is something uh, where we have already started to deploy $60 million under the capital grant component of this program. Uh, this is a pretty exciting opportunity to advance a number of different projects, 30, in fact, separate projects around the state that are uh, going to result in 900 new affordable units uh, in New Hampshire. Uh, these are rental units, new build uh, across the state, uh, not just in any one area, but we've gotten them geographically diverse. Uh, and then with the uh, pro with that capital grant program are a number of programs that we are instituting to help support municipalities uh, in uh, engaging in a, a process to uh, consider how to bring more housing to their community, how it might fit there, if it works in that community, and if it does, uh, what are some ways that we can help incentivize and cover some of the costs that may come with that, either strategically or in the long term. So these programs are also available and we're working with different municipalities around the state. Uh, we have a separate website for this program. It's invest603.com. Again, there's a lot more information right there. Lastly, uh, I did mention broadband. This is a pretty, uh, this is a program that for those of you who don't have broadband is a really big issue. And for those of you who don't, who already have it, it's uh, congratulations. I think that that's great, but we have a lot of areas of the state that continue to not have access to high-speed internet. And this is, uh, uh, I've referred to it as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to bring a significant amount of federal resource to bear on this issue and to get as many unserved and underserved locations around the state hooked up as quickly and as efficiently as we possibly can. We have already deployed $60 million of the $122 million that we were awarded under the ARPA funds for this specific purpose. Those funds are already being spent to expand into areas that are unserved and underserved and under the contract that we awarded to the uh, New Hampshire Electric Co-op for that purpose. Uh, we expect to see 23,000 new locations getting high-speed internet in rural areas of the state. Uh, we will be awarding uh, sometime in the next few weeks uh, the second round of that program, which I expect will see somewhere between 15 and 18,000 additional new locations, bringing us almost to 40,000 new locations getting high-speed internet in areas that in some cases have not seen anything better than dial up for decades. So uh, in terms of the capability that this brings to recruit and retain a workforce for employers to be able to access uh, the internet to do their business, um, to help uh, individuals and, and uh, elderly uh, reach their doctors using telehealth and video services, uh, the list is somewhat uh, endless. Uh, and the Internet is a very, very critical component of all commerce in the state. And if we can move quickly, as we are, and get those changes and get those investments made quicker than states we compete with, we will see the value of that uh, once again um, uh, for a long time to come. So... Uh, again, that's me uh, whipping through a whole bunch of stuff. There's a lot more there, obviously. I look forward to talking with you as the session goes on. As I mentioned, uh, my friend Brian Gottlob and uh, others will have more to add to these same uh, components as we uh, as you go through your day. But I'm happy to answer any questions. Commissioner, uh, thank I, you uh, so much. There's a question behind you. Representative Edwards. Yeah, hi. Thank hey. you so much. I'll, I'll, I'll just speak up without the mic. As I'm looking at your eight functional areas critical for economic development, I notice that energy costs and a nationally competitive tax structure are not bullets. Would you, would you tell us why that's, those are not foci of, of your group? Well, I wouldn't say they're not uh, foci. Uh, we certainly recognize the value of our tax uh, program, and it is a major component of what we do in terms of recruitment and retention. Uh, so the value of our tax structure uh, it should not be understated. Uh, and in, I guess, some ways, it's been so much part of the culture of the work that we do that maybe it didn't get its own line here. But it is definitely, uh, definitely a component. In terms of energy, uh, this is a challenge, uh, much like housing, that we are not alone in facing. Uh, and uh, I think that there's... Um, there's been some market, um, some market reaction, at least on the commercial side, to the fact that we do have high energy rates in New, in New Hampshire and in New England generally. 
So we have seen maybe a decline in the type of heavy industry that that uh, that we saw uh, through many many decades back, you know, going back uh, some time now, and we're seeing an increase in terms of businesses in the tech space or in life sciences or in other areas that maybe have a, a lower uh, uh, cost per uh, dollar of investment, let's say, uh, in energy than some of those heavy industry manufacturers. So there, there's an adaptation that's occurring, and we don't spend a lot of time going after like big metal uh, manufacturers uh, to locate in New Hampshire, but we do spend a lot of time trying to get uh, you know, new life science companies to come here to New Hampshire because the access to a, a world-class workforce exists and because, you know, there are other aspects to that business type that um, uh, that recognize, the, in particular, the energy issue. Thank you. You're welcome. Representative McGuire is also behind you. <laughs> well, I'm glad to be So there was an article in the Union Leader recently that said that 16% of all home sales in the state go to people moving here from Massachusetts. And that's greater than the sum of all people moving here from all other, other states. So that implies that 50% of your marketing should be directed at Massachusetts. Is that what you're doing? I, I, I don't know if it's 50% dead on, but for sure. Massachusetts, uh, Connecticut, and we have uh, we have increased our uh, our presence in the New York area as well um, over the, over the last couple of years. But no question, uh, Boston in particular, and you know again connecting that to the type of uh, businesses that we're seeing with the highest level of growth and the high uh, high quality high education needs of those uh, of those individuals, it fits very nicely. Without question, Representative Almy. Thank you. Uh, two things that I always find lacking in this: uh, one on the taxation side, that businesses pay property taxes, mm -hmm. and property taxes are two thirds of our tax system, and we pay no attention to that usually in this body. Um, and I don't know if you've had conversations with businesses that were calculating, and if you go after businesses that don't need much real property in order to function here. But the other one is that there is on the people in this state that earn under the median, um, we have fewer and fewer of them willing to work in the services that maintain the infrastructure and the recreation and um, the general quality of life of the ones that uh, are in the higher income brackets. And living in Lebanon, as I do, which on um, I just noticed your chart says that Grafton County as a whole has the highest increase in housing costs and the second highest amount of housing cost in the state and most of that is my area yes uh, then on the we have a extraordinary number of young people that have come to work in our startups and in dartmouth medical and in dartmouth college on who on are always on the internet complaining. We have no target, we have no place to go in the evening. Um, we can't get anybody to repair the gadget in our house that broke uh, and or to put in a new heating system. Um, and there we, we have been training, aside from the housing problem, which is huge, uh, we have been training people for 30 years in our schools not to want to do that kind of thing, to be told that success means you go to college, and so a whole bunch of kids drop out and start doing drugs. Representative, is there a question there? Yes. <laughs> uh, can you possibly uh, talk about whether you are working with companion groups in other departments about these problems? <laughs> yes, on all of them, and I agree with the, uh, many of the points that you made, Representative. As usual, I think um, uh, Lebanon certainly is a very popular area, uh, and I think many reasons why there are 
challenges in, in particular that area, but it's not unique. Uh, there are the same challenges in all parts of the state. Uh, in terms of workforce and workforce training, uh, we absolutely work very closely with uh, the community college system and our CTE uh, um, programs around the state and look for opportunity, opportunities to invest uh, both either in terms of technical resource, but actually in financial dollars in those programs to do a lot of things you've just said. Um, the, the degree to which uh, we have challenges in services and hospitality all continue to remain. I would say uh, there's been a little glimmer of hope in the service industry, nationally speaking anyway. We don't have uh, the, the most recent data for New Hampshire yet, but uh, there is some hope, I think, in people coming back to the, some of those jobs uh, on a national scale. We'll hope that we see similar trends here in New Hampshire. But uh, there are questions, and I think you'll see one of the slides that I'm pretty sure Brian always likes to show that you'll see after lunch is uh, where the gap is in terms of the individuals uh, who are, have not returned to the workforce. We have not yet quite gotten to where we were at 2019 in terms of individuals working in the, you know, res the residents in New Hampshire that are working. And there's a specific popu population that, uh, that falls into that category. Um, a lot of times it has to do with whether or not individuals have uh, responsibilities for others in their family. Uh, so that gives you, I think, a very uh, a, a, a look at either end of the workforce age spectrum. Um, so we continue to try to find ways to get those individuals back into the workforce to make up some of the gap. But I have to say, probably in the end, if we got every single person uh, in New Hampshire who's not working, who could be working, working, we'd still have a gap. So um, the challenges remain. Uh, I think the tools that we have at our disposal are uh, training and giving people opportunities to see the value of, uh, I mean, if you were an electrician anywhere in uh, North Country these days, you'd, you'd probably be doing pretty well. Uh, you know, I know one in Littleton is telling me that they don't even think about coming out until April uh, at this point for that type of work. Uh, and you've got companies that are able to really pick and choose the type of areas that they're in um, based on the reality. So that leaves gaps that still exist. Representative Elber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I represent a, uh, Ward 1 in Nashua. Uh, I have, when I was campaigning, I spoke with a good many people who were talking about how they live in Nashua, but they can't afford to, to work in Nashua. Teachers who can earn $20,000 a year more by just going across the border. Uh, what are we doing in terms of, or what's your office doing in terms of looking at salaries? Nashua, for example, was uh, looking for a master's level speech pathologist paying $49,000 a year. Now, my own research showed me that the average one-bedroom apartment in Nashua was $1,700 a month, which meant that the growth, more than 20% of that staff member's salary would be going toward rent. How are we approaching the fact that employers aren't paying enough to be able to allow people to afford to work here? Well, I think I would say a couple things. Well, first of all, employers, uh, if they are experiencing shortages in their workforce, typically will find the, among the tools they have to attract the workforce is paying more. And uh, that's something that uh, we certainly um, remind them of as much as we, as we can. But I would say on the other side, uh, with regard to the housing component, again, this goes uh, to the most basic need of any individual, which is to have housing that, um, that matches uh, the basic income levels in, in an area. And that's where we have some capability to at least raise the issue. We have $100 million that we're putting towards this program uh, uh, through the Invest in H program, and that uh, just scratches the surface. Right. I think there are a multitude of reasons that you can get into as to what causes all of these things to happen, most of which the government doesn't have a lot of control over. But we can make uh, some investments and demonstrate that uh, by, by making some investments, by making some um, alterations to local policies to be able to accommodate those individuals, that we can make some progress in affecting the vacancy rates, which, in, which will in turn affect the total um, rent costs that are in any individual community. 
Thank you. And Representative thank you, Madam Petrie, Chair. you're welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, work participation rate versus, uh, say, 20 or 30 years ago is on a decline, and how do you determine that that rate? <sighs> I don't know. I can't. I can't say specifically that uh, uh, I can. I can riddle off the top of my head what the labor participation rates were uh, at that rate. But we do have uh, nationally one of the highest labor participation rates. We were in the seventies last I saw. Um, and again, I'm pretty certain you're going to see a slide from Brian on that. This is an area that he really focuses on because we we have seen that slip since COVID. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions? It's Representative Bolton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, regarding housing, um, I live in Plymouth, and there um, is some wrestling over the language of zoning changes that must be put in place in order to encourage uh, workforce housing or mm -hmm. affordable housing. Is there model language that yep. you've been producing that you can share? Uh, so with the uh, I would say... Uh, it would be easy to connect them to me and I will get them to the right place, but it is, we have staff, but we also work with New Hampshire housing and New Hampshire housing has uh, actually some funding that is available through our invest in H program to help um, local communities that want to make some analysis or review or changes to their zoning rules to, to participate in the program um, at no cost. So that's a worthy program to look at. But if you want to send them to me, I'm taylor.caswell at nh.gov. Pretty easy. Thank you very much. Just send them to me. Wonderful presentation. We appreciate your coming here today. Everyone, you should take a break until 1 o'clock and then come back. And then we will get demographic information, which is what you've been asking about. So thank you. I've been building them up pretty heavy, so. You're all working on business one step. It look like so we have uh, actually a contract going to the council at their next meeting uh, that's going to uh, allow us to work with an organization.
Oh, uh, yeah. Good afternoon. <laughs> Remind me. Hi. <laughs> Good afternoon. The time being one o'clock, we should probably get started. It's actually one o two. Welcome back to the 2000, no, 2023 Joint Economic Briefing. Uh, we have special guests, uh, Rich Lavers from de the Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Employment Security, and Brian Gottlieb, the Director of Economic and Labor Market Information. And both of you, hopefully, will educate us on the state's labor market, among other things. So we appreciate your being here today. All right, well, thank you so much. So we do, everyone, should have copies of the slides that Brian and I will be working from. So I'll kick us off. I'll talk for a little bit, hopefully not too much. Uh, Brian will then present, we'll go back and forth, and then Brian will have the big finish, um, really trying to set up those expectations for his part of the presentation here and deflate mine. So, um, well, let's get, let's get started. Um, so um, I'll multitask here. I'll work the computer and talk at the same time. So our, our first slide that, that folks have, and uh, trying just to put everything into context for what we've experienced uh, coming out of the pandemic caused recession from a labor force perspective. You can see here that we have a comparison of, of how the state did coming out of the great recession compared to the labor force recovery um, coming out of the pandemic. Um, so when we when we look at labor force recovery and we look at that peak recession um, uh, uh, labor force number, um, it took us nearly seven years uh, to get back to that peak coming out of the Great Recession. Um, you compare that to how quickly we were able to recover private sector employment lost during the pandemic recession, uh, we're looking at about two and a half years. So really no comparison uh, between the two, hard to put the two of them on the same chart, um, but we felt it was important to show how quickly things um, occurred from a labor force perspective, both uh, on, the, on the downturn um, back in 2020, and then how quickly the state has been able to recover private sector employment uh, coming out of the pandemic caused recession. Uh, how, how New Hampshire is doing um, compared to other states. So again, looking at our private sector employment and um, right now you see New Hampshire, um, the red bar. Um, you also see that we've noted our other uh, New England states, but New Hampshire is a little bit um, over 1% above where we were in our pre-pandemic peak, again, for private sector employment. Um, and you see um, Maine is, is right up there with New Hampshire in terms of having recovered all of its private sector employment um, and then some. Um, other New England states are, are not there yet. You see where, where Massachusetts is, Connecticut, uh, Rhode Island, and Vermont still have uh, some distance to go in terms of recovering that lost private sector employment, um, and, uh, but puts it into perspective of how New Hampshire fares compared to the rest of uh, the Northeast. Um, now, I, I could tell you that everyone is happy. Every sector has shared in that recovery equally, um, but we all know uh, that is not the case. Um, and what this next slide uh, presents to you is a breakdown of employment gains and losses um, compared back to pre-pandemic and how each of our sectors are doing from uh, the perspective of the number of jobs in that sector. Uh, for this slide, what we use uh, for numbers are, are taken from our quarterly census of employment and wages. So these are the actual uh, reports filed by New Hampshire businesses that have employment. Uh, they file that on a quarterly basis when they report uh, their um, employees and the wages paid uh, to employment security as part of the unemployment um, insurance uh, tax system. Uh, so that's where this da data is coming from. And here you can see the sectors that have had the, the largest amount of growth 
uh, with our, our professional uh, scientific and, and technical services. So there's a lot of IT occupations in this sector, um, um, architects, legal, engineering. Um, so a lot of higher paying type of professions um, in, in this sector that have had the most growth. Um, construction has fared well um, from an employment perspective. Um, and then as we move down um, this chart, you can see those sectors that have shed um, employment and those that have had uh, a, a more difficult time than others um, in getting back to uh, where they were prior to the pandemic. Um, and you can see down at, at the bottom of this chart, those sectors that have lost the most employment, um, you see a lot of our healthcare uh, sector. So uh, long-term care facilities, hospitals, um, those are, are continuing to have the, the hardest time of getting back to where they were pre-pandemic. Uh, state government, um, is also down there. We've we've highlighted that in the in the red bar, and then our, our retail employers as well, still significantly down. Um, the next two slides try to put that. Sir, in there. could we while we're on that slide, could we? Would you entertain questions? Absolutely. Excellent, uh, Senator. Thank you, Madam Chair. Do you know it? Uh, do you track child care as one of the sectors? I don't see them on here, but we've heard that. There's about a 50% decline in capacity. So there, and, and Brian will chime in here too. So childcare is part of the social assistance sector um, and how it is tracked here. Um, number of establishments in terms of um, those that are providing care um, and the number of workers, what do we have currently, Brian? Um, we're down in the number of providers. We're probably down in terms of employment, somewhere between 10 to 20 percent, probably, uh, I would say probably closer to 15 percent um, in terms of employment. That's a national trend, by the way. Um, uh, nationally, it, it has been rebounding somewhat. We don't keep track of the number of spaces in that's something that I think the Department of Health and Human Services tracks that. We don't have that. We do have the number of, of employees. And we do have some uh, additional, there are some other slides that we'll, we'll touch upon that too as well, Senator. This is a representative behind you. Representative McGuire has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This uh, chart doesn't make the distinction between part-time and full-time employment, um, and you're absolutely correct. We did see a lot of um, businesses that uh, that ceased operating uh, during the pandemic, a lot of retail, a, a lot of uh, food services, restaurants um, did as well. But one of the things, and we don't have this, unfortunately, in this particular presentation, but we do in others, uh, the number of businesses that have started up um, new businesses that have come to replace those businesses has really been remarkable. We've seen um, some of the highest levels of new business starts in our state uh, in the time that I've been looking at the data, which is um, at least a couple of decades. So we've replaced a lot of those. Representative Leapley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a question. This graph is, I'm assuming this number is number of jobs. So how does that, that is compare? Correct. Um, it's hard for me to understand what 6,000 jobs gained or lost means. Can you kind of help translate that for me? <laughs> that is a perfect segue into the next chart. <laughs> Thank you so much, Representative. While we're here, though, we have a question from Representative Almy. Didn't want to get in the way, but um, we've, we've got a lot of former employees of heads of restaurants that have founded their own places and are now discovering they don't have enough people work to work for them. But um, I wanted to ask about state government. Does that include municipal? That does county? not. So they're just not on the chart. They're not on the chart. I will, I will say um, 
it's interesting because I just did a, a, another presentation this morning where I did look at local government, and local government is around the same number of, of declines. And when I look at no, local government, I'm excluding educational services, so it's not counting schools, just looking at the uh, the executive uh, portion of, of uh, local government. And it's down somewhere in the order of between fourteen and 1,500 as well. Thank you. Representative Rochford. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just looking at the losses again, the job losses uh, as it relates to like, nursing, nursing in residential care facilities, hospitals, health care. Um, are you attributing, are you able to attribute that to burnout uh, of employees? Because clearly these facilities are, are, would hire if they could. And this, this data set doesn't capture that, right? But certainly with um, not only anecdotal evidence, but with the stories that we hear and, and talking with uh, those employer groups, certainly burnout is a, a big factor um, with that service sector type work, particularly in healthcare. We, we do see quit rates in the healthcare industry have risen sharply. Traditionally, they've had lower quit rates um, among all industries. Um, hospitality has high quit rates, retail has high quit rates. Traditionally, healthcare has low quit rates. It has increased very sharply um, post pandemic and during the pandemic. Um, the other thing that we attribute this to, we know that there's job openings in the healthcare industry. It is perennially, at least in the last few years, been at the top of the list of job openings in the state. So it's not a function of lack of demand. Um, it's a function of lack of supply in, in the field occupations. And that was going back prior to the pandemic, you know, registered nurses are, are one of the most high demand occupations when we look at posting data. And that, you know, that was true before the pandemic. It's even um, more so true now. Representative Fellows. Thank you. Um, can you tell me if, in particular, like the nursing um, bar, if it includes the traveling nurses, the ones that come here on work for an agency and come here on a you know short term basis that that would be in a in a different industry that would be because they're generally hired by um, though they belong to employment service organizations um, so they're not technically employed specifically by a, a health care provider but rather by some sort of employment agency so they tend to they fall into um, the administrative and support services which is includes um, um, temporary help agencies. So the, occup the occupation itself um, actually hasn't shrunk that much. It's just that the demand has been so high. And the, the demand is a, a little bit more diversified as well. And, and, and talking about some of it shifting to the, the, the temporary uh, type of occupational providers. But also looking at other non healthcare type of employers who have positions requiring that that nursing skill set. Um, so you see a, a lot of that occupational skill set in those other sectors as well. Because the the amount of hiring that's being done of that occupational skill set is about the same as it was right. prior to the pandemic. It's just a lot of it is being done outside of the healthcare sector. People like organizations like Walmart, CVS, um, you know, retail operators are hiring healthcare providers. Um, they're hiring nurses, they're hiring pharmacists. So that's not showing up in these in the healthcare industries. It is showing up in the occupational data, which is a separate data set. Um, so trying to put this into perspective, so you know, great question, sixty six hundred job gains. Um, do I care about that? What is that in relationship to the to the sector, to the state's private sector employment base? Um, does it matter? Um, here you can see when we look at the gains and losses as a percentage of those sectors, um, and what those numbers uh, from that uh, from that prior slide actually translate to for the significance within that sector. So again. Uh, professional, scientific, and technical services being at the top in terms of gains. You can see that that gain is about a 17% gain in terms of employment 
<clears throat> within that sector. And then we look at our sectors that have lost. You see that our, our social assistance down a little over 7% long-term care facilities and, and nursing and residential being down eight and a half percent um, and hospitals down uh, close to six percent. So you can see what those gains and losses represent to that sector. And in our, our next slide, we look at what those sectors mean for total private sector employment within the state. So here you can see what percentage or what share each of these sectors is um, in terms of the amount of employees that they have as a percentage of the state's total private sector employment base. <clears throat> um, moving right along here, so um, looking at what the activity is uh, um, currently um, experiencing right now in the unemployment program, um, you'll see that um, here in this slide that the initial claims for unemployment, so people filing that initial claim having um, lost uh, covered employment, uh, being through no fault of their own, those initial claims are significantly down uh, when we compare that to prior to the pandemic. You know, the, the pandemic period kind of throws all comparisons out uh, when we look at the fact that we had 175,000 people filing, we paid more benefits in two years than we did in the entire prior decade. So when we look back at prior uh, to the pandemic and we look at those initial claims, New Hampshire is about 40% uh, below where we were for initial claim volume. Compare that to the, the country as a whole, um, not really the case uh, nationally in terms of that uh, large of a decline in initial claims, nationally down about 10%. Um, when we look at weekly claims, so payable claims, claims that a, an individual is filing as they continue to be unemployed and seeking unemployment benefits, um, those that, that volume is about 36% below where we were prior to the pandemic that now these both both of these charts are a four week moving average this data comes out every thursday um so it's a nice high frequency metric for us to look at um, and compare against pre-pandemic um, but new hampshire down 36 percent in weekly weekly claims in the unemployment program you compare that against our neighbor to the south with massachusetts they're down about seven percent and nationally, that's down about 16%. So again, New Hampshire is an outlier with regard to the significant decline in utilization of the unemployment program um, throughout 2022 when we compare back to the prior to the pandemic. Um, so not only are our claims down in, in New Hampshire near record lows, but also our duration. So the, the length of time that someone is filing an unemployment claim, that is significantly down as well. Uh, this slide tries to put that into perspective, and you can see that New Hampshire has about the fifth lowest average duration at about 10 weeks. Um, we compare that out against our other New England neighbors, um, and you can see that New Hampshire really um, is a, an outlier in the Northeast uh, for the duration of an average unemployment claim uh, right now. And getting into some of the other um, uh, questions about the increased demand uh, for labor. Um, so what you can what you can see here from a quarterly perspective is, how uh, New Hampshire has increased the number of employers um, going back to prior to the pandemic. So these are employers that are providing employment in New Hampshire. They register with employment security uh, as is required for purposes of their supporting the unemployment program through payment of quarterly taxes. So the number of registered employers is up about 14%. Uh, percent. Um, when you look at uh, where we were at the beginning of the pandemic, that first quarter of 2020, a little over 43,000 registered employers uh, to where we are 
um, uh, currently, based on the, this data, are up over 52,000 employers. So a lot of additional demand uh, for a tight supply of labor. And moving right along, um, looking at the taxes um, and the overall burden on employers um, from an unemployment insurance perspective. So employers, through their payment of quarterly taxes, support the unemployment program and the payment of benefits that go out. Um, and, and what we show here is how employer and unemployment taxes, what we experienced during the pandemic, what has occurred since, how that compared against the Great Recession. Um, and, and this is all leading to uh, uh, kind of trying to show you the pieces that contribute to how our unemployment trust fund is currently doing. Um, so here you can see Great Recession peak tax rate. Employers were up over 3.6%. That's the uh, rate that they pay on the first $14,000 in annual wages paid to each employee. Um, so um, peaked at almost 3.7%, had four quarters over 3.3%. Uh, for the Great Recession. You compare that to the pandemic, um, and we peaked at about 2.3%, so close to 40% below our Great Recession peak. And those rates have come down significant, significantly and would be down even more if not for the substantial increase in new employers registered with the state. And I say that because when, a, when an employer comes in and registers for the first time, setting up their, their unemployment account, they are automatically signed a new employer tax rate of 2.7%. Um, that rate goes up or down based on their experience in their first four quarters. Uh, but that, that many new employers, all starting at 2.7%, actually um, inflates that average uh, tax rate that you see here of 1.42%. So more established employers are paying at a, at a much lower rate, um, but it, it looks a little bit higher because of the, uh, the number of new employers registering at that higher rate. Representative Platt. How sticky is that 2.7%? How long do they have to be in your good graces before it goes down significantly? <laughs> uh, so, so they keep that 2.7% with, with one caveat that I'll explain for the first four quarters. Um, the one caveat is that if there are any uh, fund balance uh, reductions, so uh, the statutory solvency control for the trust fund, which automatically requires a reduction in employer rates based upon the balance in the trust fund, if those kick in in any of those four quarters, that new employer does benefit from those. For instance, right now, employers are receiving a half point fund balance reduction because the unemployment trust fund um, maintained at least a balance of 250 million dollars during the third quarter of last year so and so those positive rated tax paying employers got a half point reduction in the fourth quarter new employers would also get that so that 2.7 percent employer would be down at 2.2 percent and then uh, following years after that, that employer's rate is adjusted based on their experience. So if they've, for some reason, had a lot of layoff activity and we've paid out a lot of benefits, that's a, that's a negative against their experience, increasing their rate. If they haven't had any layoff activity, we haven't paid out any benefits, um, but they've paid their taxes timely, then that's a positive on their rate and that brings down that experience-based rate so they would be paying less than that 2.7 percent going into that second year of existence. Representative Almi. Thank you Madam Chair. Could um, First, if you have an employer with one employee, say a woman with a nanny, uh, is, are they obliged to register and pay this? Depending on the, the amount of wages that they're paying to that nanny, yes. If they say that she's working full time and she's getting $100 a month, do you do anything about it? Uh, so the, they don't report to us whether that 
person is working full time or part time. That's not part of the reporting. Um, but once they um, exceed a certain number of wages paid to that individual, they're required to then register and report and pay taxes on those wages. Thank you. A small follow up, or rather a larger follow up, on our. Um, do you have information on how many of the new employers and the employers in general are, have more than 10 workers, for instance, or something like that? We do. Yes. We don't have that in, in these slides, but we can certainly um, get that to you and get it to the yeah. members and, of the committee, both committees. Whether that's changed between the new people and what we used to have. Thanks. Um, and so um, moving on here, um, looking at overall tax burden. So each state has a slightly different uh, uh, unemployment insurance tax system, different taxable wage bases, experience is factored differently from state to state. So a great way to compare one state to the, the next in terms of how much of a overall tax burden is attributed to un unemployment insurance taxes. We look at total unemployment insurance taxes paid as a comparison against total wages paid. And here you can see New Hampshire um, in, that, in the red bar at about 0.4% uh, um, and how that compares to other states in the Northeast. Again, New Hampshire stacks up very well um, with, uh, with our um, neighboring states from an overall um, tax burden perspective for how much employers are required to contribute to the functioning of the unemployment program. And um, last slide for me, and then I'll turn it over to Brian, but all of those factors, so increase in employers, um, low number of claims being filed, low duration of claims being filed, um, you can see all of that contributes to the overall health of the unemployment uh, trust fund. Uh, right now, uh, we're at about $357 million in that account. We started the pandemic at uh, right at $300 million. Um, we have benefited uh, from uh, federal dollars, federal um, uh, CARES Act money uh, that has been um, deposited into the trust fund um, that was originally designated for other uses, not used for those other other programs, um, but rather than those dollars go back to the feds, those dollars have been waterfalled into the unemployment trust fund. That's about $109 million that's gone into the trust fund. So right now we're at $357 million. Um, and important to note that that balance and that, that speedy recovery in the unemployment trust fund has led to employers getting a tax rate reduction much faster than originally anticipated. So because the unemployment trust fund reached and maintained a balance of $250 million during the third quarter of 2022, employers started receiving a reduction of a half point to their rate. So that 2.7% employer, new employer, got their rate knocked down to 2.2% uh, for the fourth quarter. Uh, they will also have that same rate reduction for the first quarter that we're currently in. The savings that are forecast for the that rate reduction for employers over the course of those two quarters is about $28 million in savings because of the accelerated pace which the trust fund has recovered. Um, and, and now it's uh, further um, contributing to reducing those rates making it less expensive for those employers to hire because every employee that they bring on uh, comes with that cost of paying their unemployment insurance taxes for the first $14,000 in annual wages to that employee. So all of that savings uh, making things a little bit more affordable uh, for that employer. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Brian now to go on the next slide. Bring we have a few <clears throat> questions. Oh. If we could just see if we can address sure. those first behind you. Representative McGuire. in here about workers' comp. Um, I know we, in the past, we haven't compared very favorably to other states on that regard. Can you talk about that? Um, we are, are not involved in the administration of the workers' comp program, so we're uh, strictly in the unemployment compensation program, so workers' comp is managed by the 
uh, State Department of Labor. Uh, so um, any questions that uh, we have on that, I'd have to defer to those folks. Representative Plett. Yes, earlier a discussion about uh, quit rate, uh, people voluntarily leaving the labor force. How do you know? You you survey employers because yeah. it, it yeah. doesn't show up in the unemployment lines. Yeah, the um, U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics does a monthly survey of employers, um, including employers in New Hampshire. So um, the quit rate is based on that. Representative Pitre. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, we heard this morning that uh, New Hampshire's participation participation rate was around 62 percent nationally it's a little over 70 percent why is there such a actually it's not accurate um, new hampshire has a higher labor force participation rate we're just under 65 around 65 percent we have been as high as 68 percent at the peak um, and labor force participation rate by the way is is in part a function of whether people want to be in the labor force, but it's also a function of the demographics of a state. Um, people who are very young have lower participation rates, and people who are older, um, once we get beyond age 55, participation rate begins to, to slip. So um, depending on your demographics, you're going to have a higher or lower. Also, it depends on some of the um, socioeconomic characteristics of a community. New Hampshire is about 65%. Nationally, it's about 62%. It has declined in the nation. It's declined in New Hampshire. Hmm. Thank you. Representative? Put a more finer point on that. that is that a 65%? Is that the difference between 65% and 100%? Are those the people that are are not in the labor force, choose not to be in the labor force, have given up looking for a job, that, that sort of thing. Yeah, uh, to, uh, the, the way the measure is calculated is basically you have to be either employed or actively looking for work. And actively looking for work means in the prior month have you, have you searched for a job. So you will have people who are marginally attached, maybe occasionally work um, throughout the year, they could be surveyed and indicate that they're not in the labor force. Um, and it's also a me measure traditionally by ages 16 and above. So again, if you're counting everybody age 16 and above, the higher percentage you have in the upper age of, uh, range, so above 65, above 75, you're going to have a lower participation rate there. We have a number of slides that look at the details, of, and Rich is going to talk about those details of how it's changed by demographic group, and that's really, I think, instructive uh, of, of some of the things that are going on here. But I, I do want to um, move a little bit to kind of where the trends are at the moment. Um, and this is a chart that looks at job openings. Again, employers are surveyed and asked about the number of open positions that they have that they're actively searching for. Um, and this chart compares New Hampshire's always the red line, Massachusetts when we compare them, the blue line, U.S. the black line. And what you see is as the recession um, started to ease, um, the job openings rate jumped, and it jumped for a couple of reasons. One, initially, a lot of people left the labor market um, during the pandemic, but also there was a tremendous increase in the quit rate, the churning. Um, people were switching occupations. They were switching industries. Um, so even if you weren't adding new jobs, there was a tremendous need to hire because there was just a lot of churn in the labor market. And churn in the labor market is a problem for everybody. It's a problem for businesses, very costly. So those quit rates, by the way, are starting to ease. But quit rates are usually a sign, high quit rates are usually a sign that there's a lot of opportunities out there. And there was. There was following the worst of the pandemic. Employers were raising wages. Um, employees were emboldened, looking for better opportunities, better working conditions. So there was a lot of turnover. That said, um, New Hampshire had higher job openings rate um, for much of the post-pandemic, if there is such a thing, period. Um, it has come down. Um, it's come down everywhere, um, but it's still very strong. It's still um, above what it was. If I go back another 10 or 15 years, you'll see that that rate is traditionally much lower than it is now. 
Um, and this is, we talked a little bit about the kinds of occupations that are in demand. This uh, is a really busy chart. I apologize for that. This is one, you know, before bedtime as a substitute for a mild sedative or a stiff drink. You, you, might, you might take a look at, um, <laughs> uh, but some of the occupations that are highlighted here in red just gets at that one issue that we talked about, the medical professions, medical occupations. They have traditionally been among the highest in demand, and this compares the same period in 2019, September through November, to September through November of 2022, and the number and change in the demand or the job postings in New Hampshire for those occupations. And you see the tremendous jump in the percentage, both the numbers and percentage there. So across the board, strong demand in a number of occupations and industries. Um, that's, oh, was there a question? Yes, if we could. Sorry. Representative Jenigan. No. Representative Edwards, you. behind you. On the previous slide, um, I noticed healthcare workers have very high growth rate um, overall. I'm just curious if you've kept any statistics on how many of those uh, 2022 openings are driven because they're replacing workers who were forced out over mandatory vaccine policy. Well, well, uh, let, I'll, <laughs> I'll. Well beyond my uh, pay grade, um, we don't have that. I don't have any of that data. Um, so this this data set doesn't capture that. However, we do know from um, unemployment claim filings uh, that there were very, very few unemployment claims filed by individuals that uh, lost employment due to a, a vaccine requirement. Um, taking a look at the, the actual trends in job growth, this is um, year compares year over year job growth um, on a three month moving average. So New Hampshire right now, as of through November, our December numbers will be coming out next week. Um, we're about two and a half percent, two point six percent private sector job growth. It, it, compared to um, the U.S., which is a little bit higher. I do not believe that it is because we have a weaker economy than the national economy. I believe it is because we are more labor constrained. Um, we have had a tighter labor market, and I'll show you a number of, of uh, charts that will that will support that. Um, in 2021, we had faster job growth than the U.S., significantly faster, um, significantly faster in the private sector, but also total uh, non-farm job growth. This, by the way, is, is good from one perspective. The Federal Reserve is con very concerned about inflation. It wants to see the labor market slow down. It doesn't want to see job losses, but it wants to see it slow down because it's concerned about um, wage, wages rising rapidly and, co and contributing to inflation. So this is actually a, a fairly positive trend. Um, looking at, again, I say... New Hampshire is not a weaker economy. It is just more labor constrained, and this is one me way I measure that. Again, businesses are surveyed every month how many job openings they have and how many people have they hired, and that's measured here as a rate. So the job openings rate is the number of openings plus the number of people employed in total divided by that combination of numbers. So the openings rate compared to the hiring rate is the gap. It's the delta between how many jobs are available and how many and the ability to, to hire people for those jobs. And what you see here, it jumped again dramatically after the pandemic, indicating the difficulty that employers have had hiring. It was more difficult for most of this time period for New Hampshire employers to hire. Um, it is coming down a bit. It's coming down a bit because, again, openings are um, starting to ease. There's, uh, businesses are becoming a little bit more concerned about economic prospects moving forward, so they're cutting back a little bit on their expectations for hiring. Big issue that we face here in New Hampshire, I think the number one issue that our economy faces is what's happening with the labor force and our ability to get more people back into the labor force 
or new people who haven't been into the labor force in the labor force. This chart, again, New Hampshire, the red line, U.S. black, May, Massachusetts blue, just indicates compared to the pre-pandemic peak labor force, number of people in the labor force, set at a number of 100, how has it changed and where is it compared to that peak number? So the U.S. is back in terms of numbers it, to its pre-pandemic peak, not participation rate, but because there's more people, even with a lower rate, it can have the same number of people it has in the labor force as it did prior to the pandemic. New Hampshire is not there yet. We're still about 1% below our peak, and to put that into numbers, that's almost 8,000 people, fewer than we had in our peak, which was November of 2000. 19. Massachusetts is going in the opposite direction, the wrong direction. New Hampshire, by the way, took us a long time to start picking up, but we are picking up. We're seeing some pretty good uh, labor force growth over the last several months. Um, this is an extremely nerdy chart. I apologize. Uh, it takes some time, but it's my favorite measure of how tight the labor market is. Uh, most people look at the unemployment rate as the measure of uh, how tight the labor market is, but that's in part a function of how many people are actively looking for work. It's not necessarily an indicator of how many jobs are available. This measure is the employment to population ratio among what is considered the prime working age group, age 25 to 54. This is the age group that has the, by far the highest labor force participation, almost you know, 90% or more people in that age group are in the labor force. So when 85% of those people in that age group are employed in New Hampshire, I consider that full employment. And this chart shows you time periods where we've been above that 85%. Those are periods of pretty severe labor shortage. Just before the pandemic, we knew we had uh, real significant labor shortages. Back in the late 90s, we had really severe labor shortages. In contrast, following the Great Recession, you see it dipped well below. That's that seven-year period that Rich mentioned in terms of getting back to, f to um, recovering all of the jobs. So we fall like the U.S. fell during the pandemic. The U.S., by the way, has a different demographics, so their full employment is about 80%. Um, but New Hampshire, importantly, is well below that 85%. What that says to me, we've got a lot of people who are on the, on the sidelines. So when I talk to businesses and they say, oh, we've got a 2.6% unemployment rate, there's nobody to hire. I say, no, we have, this is capacity utilization. We are underutilizing the capacity of our labor force right now. And our job is really to make that labor force, increase the capacity of uh, utilization of our labor force. As much as it is getting those unemployed people, which we know is, is a small number, getting those people on the sidelines into the, into the labor force. Yes. This may be impossible to answer, but is part of the problem, less than full employment, is employers that are overly picky with their requirements? Uh, and maybe soften a little bit and do a little in-person training? That's a good question. I don't know. Um, I, 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 this is one of those when you pass it off to your boss. And, uh, <laughs> um, I think em employers have learned some good lessons about the, the problems that they create for themselves about being overly picky, as you've described it, and also being slow to hire, um, being slow to make decisions and, and, the more successful employers, the employers that have gained employment, the sectors that have gained employment, because um, there's been some real success stories uh, throughout the pandemic, they've, they've adjusted how they go about doing the hiring. But certainly the uh, old school way of thinking in terms of constantly looking at degrees and less focus on skill sets is something that um, employers are really taking a, a second look at, need to, to take a second look at in terms of um, overly limiting their candidate pools and needing to be more focused on skills rather than uh, degrees. But some, some of that, sure, employers being overly picky, but uh, that uh, I think they've learned their lesson there. Representative Liebley. Thank you. Um, my first thought was, 
you know, wage differences between our state and neighboring states. But my second thought was, is if this is based on population of people living in New Hampshire, um, is it possible more folks have chosen to work in neighboring states and so that these folks might have jobs? But that, that would be captured in this because um, the, the there's two surveys of, of employment. One is done of for employers in New Hampshire, and that measures the number of people who are actually employed in organizations in New Hampshire. And then there's a household survey, which is what the labor force estimates and the unemployment rate are based on. That basically calls households and asks people whether they're employed, whether they're looking for work, a whole host of other issues. So this measure of employment to population is irrespective of where anybody is employed. But the, to kind of go back to Brian's statement about the measure that looks at actual private sector jobs, so those are New Hampshire jobs. Um, and when you look at the, the information that we have in here, you see that those are, those are the, the jobs that are up over where they were prior to the pandemic, and we know those are New Hampshire-based. So that's up about a little over 1%. And that's a great point because sometimes you will see reports in the media that say um, New Hampshire lost X number of jobs. We've seen that in the last couple of months, when in fact that's not the case. There may be fewer New Hampshire residents who have jobs, but there hasn't been fewer jobs in New Hampshire. And so you have to make the distinction between the household survey and the payroll or employer survey. And those two surveys tend to a lot of times tell different stories, or at least on the surface, tell different stories. So Brian and I just pick the one that looks better, um, and we go with that. Uh, but but usually when you, in in all seriousness, usually when you peel back the layers of the onion um, in both of those surveys, you can find the consistencies in that they aren't aren't really telling different stories, um, and you can you can better understand them. But there, that is a good distinction between what each one, each one of those is telling you. Senator Rosenwald has a question, and then Thank Representative you, Chair. Um Do you know to what extent the people sitting on the sidelines are disproportionately women who lack access to child care that makes it worth going to work? No, we, we do have some indication of that. Um, we don't survey that, but uh, during the pandemic, um, Census Bureau and the Bureau of Labor St Statistics, but primarily the Census Bureau, asked a number of questions of households about reasons why they weren't working that were unique um, and different from the way we traditionally had asked those questions. They asked um, specifically if you... Um, you know, if you weren't working, here are some of the possible reasons why you aren't looking for work or why you are. And one of them was uh, the need to take care of a child under the age of, one was under the age of six, who did, wasn't in school and didn't have access to child care. Another one was age of seven to 14, whatever. And it wasn't, there was an increase. So we do know that that has increased. And we also have anecdotal evidence that Riches will talk about eventually um, that seems to indicate um, that it has played a role. Um, there's some gender differences there, uh, particularly among women who are, have, are most likely to have uh, the youngest uh, uh, children, you know, preschool. And I think you're up, Rich. Representative Almi had a quick question. Thank oh. you. On it's a methodological question again. Mm -hmm. On does do the does the labor department and the census department do they have access to all of our cell phones? How are they sampling? Good question. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't know, and and uh, my experience as someone who works closely with the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, anyway, um, not always. Those kinds of questions can be difficult to get answers to. Um, you will see about, um, you know, general sampling procedures, but I have not seen anything that 
says particularly um, addresses the issue of cell phones. It's pro it's problematic in any any telephone survey for sure. And I will tell you one of the problems that we've had. There's been a lot of data problems in the pandemic. One of the data problems is that response rates have been exceptionally low, and it's created more error in the data. And we've had to factor some of that in. Um, and as Rich knows, I'm not one of the favorite people of the Bureau of Labor Statistics because I ask a lot of questions. Um, and I have concerns about some of the methodologies, um, in particular with New Hampshire and the results. But, but we don't have an answer for that. I'm sorry. We, and not having an answer to that is not due to lack of effort. Um, so as, as Brian had indicated, I think it was an understatement. We did have some very interesting conversations with the Bureau of Labor <laughs> Statistics throughout the pandemic. Because um, we were um, looking at numbers that they were were releasing, we didn't feel they were fairly reflective on the actual state of the labor force in New Hampshire based on other metrics. Um, you know, we asked for to, to do things such as to do a ride along with with the survey takers, just to listen in, not not say anything. We keep our mouths shut, um, but they just kind of uh, giggled a little bit when we asked that and. Uh, they weren't going to have any part of it. So we, we try to get into the um, um, what is actually going on with that monthly survey, but it, it's, it's really, um, you know, states are really kind of kept out of that. It's a, a, a BLS function. Um, <clears throat> a couple of slides, I think, getting into uh, um, refining some of the data to look at uh, some of the questions that uh, Senator Rosenwald, you've been you've been asking here, um, and we, we try to get into that. We try to learn more <clears throat> about um, the labor force participation um, falling off from from prior to the pandemic. Overall labor force being down about eighty five hundred people compared to our pre pandemic peak. Um, so we, we we try to look at as much of the detail as we can to learn a little bit more about those characteristics. Um, not just because it's good information to have, but it also shapes our policies in terms of what we do from an engagement perspective um, in trying to promote reemployment services and programs and virtual job fairs to different populations in the state and trying to grow the labor force. So what you see here is a comparison of some data that we presented last year um, when, when we're in front of the, the joint committees. Um, with, a, with the gray bar, um, and then you see the updated information in, I guess, what we would say is an, uh, an orange uh, bar, but looking at labor force participation by, uh, by age cohorts. And um, to highlight a few areas here, so when we, were, when we were last talking with the joint committees, we had what we referred to as a bookend problem with the labor force from a participation rate perspective. We had older workers who were very slow uh, to come back to the labor force after the pandemic. So our 60 to 69 year old group, when you look at those gray bars in this chart, you see um, you know, 60 to 64 off by nearly 7%, 65 to 69 off by another 3%. And we go to the other end of the labor force spectrum uh, to complete the, that, the bookends. And you look at our 20 year olds. Um, and particularly 25 to 29 was a problematic age group when we last spoke to you, um, down about five and a half percent. Now, fast forward to where we are now with the orange line, you can see what has occurred um, during the past year since we last spoke. And you can see when we look again at those older workers, 60 to 69, quite an improvement uh, from a labor force participation perspective. So 60 to 64 year olds um, going from a 7% decline to a, just over a 1% decline, so significant improvement. And then our 65 to 69 year olds going from a 3% decline to a 2% gain, so a 5% swing there. Um, so some significant change, improved change in older workers and their participation in the labor force over the past year. But when we look at our younger workers, particularly our 25 to 29 year olds and our 30 to 34 year olds, um, 25 to 29 have been uh, stubbornly not moving uh, very much. Uh, when you look at where they were from a decline in labor force participation, 
at 5.5%, um, just a, a slight tick of an improvement down to 5.4%. So still a problematic age group from uh, labor force recovery, participation recovery, looking, you know, compared back to pre-pandemic. And then our, our 30 to 34 year olds um, have, a, have a, a, a significant decline in participation when we compare data that we had last year in the gray bar to the the more recent data looking at a little bit over of a 3% decline in labor force participation. Um, when we look at what that means from a numbers perspective, so if we, you know, we've had, as Brian has indicated, our, we've had our population increases over the last uh, few years, but when you take pre-pandemic participation rates and you layer that over those population cohorts, um, if we had that pre-pandemic participation, we'd be looking at about an additional 18,000 people participating in the labor force compared to what we have now. Uh, the, in the 20-year-old the group, that's about 9,000 additional people. When you look in the 30-some-odd-year-old group, that's a little over 6,000 additional people. So, so both from a percentage participation perspective and when you look at the raw numbers of that that is a significant impact on labor force recovery and when we, when we talk to you about still being down about a percent um, and getting back to that pre-pandemic peak and being down about 8,500 individuals participating in the labor force now you can see where um, where that shakes out what age cohorts have been uh, the, the most impacted and when we look at we we break that down a little bit further trying to get to a, a point that senator rosenwald had raised looking at the the prime uh childbearing and rearing ages when we look at 25 to 34 year olds both labor force participation and the epop with employment to population ratio compared uh, by gender you can see uh, that female participation is off more than male um, so uh, I'm going to force... stop you there. There seems to be a lot of interest in this topic. I can see hands trying to be raised right now. We're also out of time. So if you don't mind, I'm going to recognize the folks that have questions and invite you to come to House Ways and Means again, if you're interested, if, if you would be interested members, um, maybe in the next week or so. And that way we could continue if you have the time. Absolutely. Tell the... us, um, tell us when you want us back and We'll be more than happy to be there. Awesome, because obviously there's a lot of great information in here, and I think there's a lot of good questions. Representative Southworth has a question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. You might have just answered it. I was trying to match several slides back the growth in the professional uh, IT type area with the slowdown um, 25 to 29. Within my family, my nieces and nephews that are 25 to 29 are actually doing great, getting some really good jobs. So it doesn't quite match what I've heard. So I, yeah, I mean, it, it's difficult to, um, to say why or on what basis the, the 25 to 29-year-old group has stepped out of labor force. It, it, we've talked about this a lot internally. It's our, one of our, our hypotheses is that there are 25 to 29 year olds who are being compensated in some fashion, um, but they're not what would be considered or they consider employed or looking for work. Um, they may be doing gig jobs. Um, we joke about uh, an occupation that I had never heard of, people getting paid to play video games online. Apparently that is a thing. Um, but if you have a gig job, um, you're not a W-2 wage earner, um, and you're getting compensated for your gig work, and somebody from the government calls you and asks about whether you're employed and how much you're earning, um, you may be reluctant to say yes. And so w we think that, that it's not the only reason, but we do believe that it's played some role in those numbers. Um, I don't think we're actually down quite that much. They clearly are down. Um, part of that had to do early in the pandemic with the fact that they've they got a lot of stimulus money. You know, everybody got $4,000. Um, that younger cohort is was most likely to be employed, more likely to be employed in the industries that had the biggest layoffs. They received a lot of, um, you know, both uh, 
compensation from the state unemployment, but also from the federal government. So that gave them a cushion to stay out of the labor force a little bit longer. And we heard that a lot anecdotally. Now that's run out. So, uh, Representative Edwards has a question behind you. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is uh, the, for the folks who knew me on Ways and Means. This is one of my favorite topics, and that is the size of the uh, underground economy or the black market of employment. These are people who make their living by doing illegal activities or do housekeeping or something else in the margins that are just cash basis with their employer. Do we have any statistics or are we doing any data collection around the uh, size and scope of New Hampshire's underground economy? Um, so similar to prior to the pandemic and, and out here, here we are in 2023, um, we capture for in terms of employment that which is compensated on a W-2. That's what's reported to us on the, on the quarterly census of employment and wages. Uh, so to the extent that that existed prior to the pandemic, um, as I am sure that it did, hence why several agencies have auditors that are traveling the state occasionally to talk to employers and why we get blocked unemployment claims from people who file and then uh, don't have any wages on record and we have to determine what's going on. I'm sure that is still uh, going on, um, but the uh, participate the participation drop off um, here, I would we theorize is more attributed to that non traditional but still perfectly legal type of employment, albeit compensated by a 1099 and not a traditional covered employment situation of W two type employment. Now, there might be a, an opportunity to uh, be able to compare some of that with 1099 activity. Um, we've, we've talked about that. And there might be, uh, as we do experience that uh, uh, slowdown um, in 2023, there might be a more of a movement back to what is perceived as more stable traditional employment as well, which could drive some of that non-traditional employment, but legal, um, internet-based uh, gig type of work, maybe back to traditional employment. Uh, but the to the extent that there's uh, uh, the uh, cash type of economy, and that is um, uh, part of um, the situation. Well, that you know that um, that existed prior to the pandemic. Uh, to the extent it continues to exist. Before I shut you off completely, I just realized that I don't see our next presenter. Is Dr. Kenneth Johnson here? You are wonderful. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. So, ah, yes, Representative Spillsbury, we got a couple quick questions and then we'll wrap it up. Thanks. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, before we have our guests return, I would love to have this slide set uh, sent as an email attachment so I can absorb the glorious color and get more out of it than I did from the miniaturized version. Everything you've received it, today is yes. in an email and the link and on the website. Brilliant. So You're please go look back at your email from Miss Jennifer Four, and you will find all of these attachments in full color. But there'll be spoiler alerts if you look at it, because we were going to give you our forecast, and now you're going to, the spoiler <laughs> alert. There's no reason for us to come back. We may actually have an <laughs> opening in our schedule next Tuesday afternoon. If you could check yours, let us know. I have a feeling both of our schedules are open during whatever time you have available. we love to hear that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To be continued. Awesome. Well, then we will uh, recommend, uh, recognize Dr. Kenneth Johnson to come on up. Dr. Johnson is a senior demographer at the Carsey School of Public Policy, professor of sociology at the University of New Hampshire, and, at Ar and an Ar Andrew Carnegie Fellow. Sorry about that. Welcome. Please use the microphone so we can hear you better. 
Thank you so much. Sorry. Thank you. So this is the difficult time to be a demographer. Although the 2020 census is done, there's been delays in the release of the data from it. So that complicates my job of trying to talk to you about what's going on right now, but I'll do the best I can. I'd just like to acknowledge the funding agencies who've supported my research. And one thing that's going to come out in the, in the data that we're going to see is that long term, the population gains to the state of New Hampshire have diminished. New Hampshire is not growing as much as it was during the 70s, 80s, 90s. But in the short term, it's actually grown uh, modestly. And when I'm when I talk about what's going on in New Hampshire, there are different elements, different dem demographic elements to it. On the one hand, there's natural change, which I'll sometimes call natural increase or natural decrease, which is the difference between the number of births and deaths that occur in the state. And then the other big factor, and this is increasingly important in New Hampshire, is net migration, which is the difference between the number of people who move into New Hampshire and the number of people who leave New Hampshire. And I'll talk about two different kinds of migration. One is domestic migration, which is people coming to New Hampshire from other US destinations. And the other is immigration, which is people coming from another country. So this is just recent trends. This is 2010 to 2020, so this is from the US Census. You can see that New Hampshire was the second fastest growing of the New England states after Massachusetts. And one thing I want to draw your attention to, and this will become a common theme, the gray bar that you can see for New Hampshire is migration. That's the difference between the number of people who moved to New Hampshire and the number of people who left. And you can see that the primary source of population growth in New Hampshire is migration. The orange bar is natural increase, the difference between the number of deaths and the number of births. And you can see that that's very modest compared to the migration as a factor. So this is 2010 to 2020. This is the newest data that we have, and these are estimates, so they are subject to some variability, but they'll, they're generally accurate. And you can see again, this is New Hampshire from the census in April of 2020 to July of 2022, which is the newest data that's available. And you can see that again, migration fueled all of the growth in New Hampshire. And in fact, that more people died in New Hampshire than were born. Now, in part, this is a function of COVID, which increased the number of deaths in New Hampshire, as it did, as you can see, in New England and almost all the New England states, there were more deaths than births. And actually, in the United States, more generally, 24 states had more people dying than, than be born in the last year. That's way more than has ever happened in the past. The highest number of states to have more deaths than births in US history is five, and that was in 2019. Before that, it would be unusual for more than one or two states to have more people die than them be born. So COVID is a big factor here, but New Hampshire actually had more people dying in it than being born even before COVID. So migration is the driving force in demographic change in New Hampshire, as you can see here as well. These are long-term trends for New Hampshire. You can see the 70s and 80s when the population was growing dramatically. And again, here in those earlier years, it's a function of both migration and natural increase that was fueling the growth of New Hampshire's population. As we get into the more recent periods, population change slows in New Hampshire. And then again, you can see for 2010 to 2020 that um, it was all driven by migration and it was relatively small growth. These are more recent data, and I wanted you to see the effect of the recession and the aftermath of the recession on New Hampshire demographic trends, and then what's happened since then. So 2010 to 2015, although The Economist would tell you that the recession was over in 2010, it certainly wasn't. And even The Economists, who were just here before me, made a point of showing you that the impact of the recession went on well into the 2010 to 2020 period. It did not demography, too. You can see in New Hampshire that early in the period just after the recession ended, that migration to New Hampshire had slowed down, particularly domestic migration, the orange bar. As we get into the later part of the decade, migration picked up, but you can see that there's very little actually natural decrease began. And then in the, in the most recent two and a half years or two and a quarter years, 
you can see the uptick in migration, domestic migration in particular, that is people coming to New Hampshire from other U.S. destinations. And also we had modest immigration, but natural decrease, the excess of births over deaths, the red bar, I'm sorry, the excess of deaths over births, produced population loss. So literally all of New Hampshire's population gain in the last two and a half years has been from migration. Now, this is an important slide and one that I, I would hope that if you're gonna remember one thing from this talk, this would be one of the things I'd like you to remember. When I talk about migration, I'm usually talking about net migration, which is the difference between the number of people moving into New Hampshire and the number of people leaving New Hampshire. If you look at the domestic migration, that middle set of bars, that little gray bar, which is the amount of domestic migration net, is a function of almost 250,000 people moving into New Hampshire and 215,000 people leaving New Hampshire. In other words, there's a lot of turnover in New Hampshire's population. And I think that's something that's often not recognized, that that little bit of net change is the function of a lot of people coming and a lot of people going from the state. You can also see the number of births and deaths that were going on that produced that modest loss. This is 2015 to 19. And then you can see immigration as well. So again, when we talk about net change in New Hampshire's population, recognize that a lot of the people who are here are gone and a lot of new people are here. This is births and deaths in New Hampshire. You can see the, the fall off in the number of births in New Hampshire, which began during the Great Recession and has continued on. There has been essentially no recovery in the birth rates from the Great Recession. The, during the Great Recession, the birth rates dropped quite dramatically in the United States, not just in New Hampshire, and there has been little, if any, evidence of recovery in those birth rates. So the birth, number of births in the United States is quite low uh, compared to what it would have been had the birth rates that were common in the United States at the time of the Great Recession continued. My estimate is that about 8 million fewer babies have been born in the United States over the last 15 years or so than would have been born. You can also see the gradual increase in the death rates in New Hampshire. That's primarily a function of the aging of New Hampshire's population. But of course, you can see COVID's effect near the end of that period. So I talked to you about migration in New Hampshire, and I, I, I wanted to talk about this a little bit more. New only 41% of the people who are living in New Hampshire were born in New Hampshire, 41%. Only three states have a smaller proportion of their population born in the state. New Hampshire has a lot of population that comes from other U.S. destinations, and you can see that in the red bar on the right-hand side, which shows New Hampshire, the place of birth in New Hampshire's current residents. New Hampshire has a very modest number of, of foreign-born people. Uh, and then you can compare that to New England and to the United States more generally. And you can see the striking difference in the proportion of New Hampshire's population that was born somewhere else in the United States. So for all of the people who think that this is where, I mean, that who remember the West Wing and Jeb Bartlett, who'd been in New Hampshire for, what, 10 generations? Somebody had signed the, the Declaration of Independence. New Hampshire is not really like that. It has a very large proportion of its population born else. How many of you were born in New Hampshire? I, I rest my case. Okay. Yes. <laughs> They're still owning businesses here. They're still doing all the things that people do in New Hampshire. This is where New Hampshire domestic migrants, that is people moving within the United States, come from. And as you can see, the largest source of in-migrants to New Hampshire is Massachusetts. In fact, 23% of the people who live in New Hampshire were born in Massachusetts. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, you can see when people leave New Hampshire, where they go. Some go to Massachusetts. Many more go to the Sun Belt than come from the Sun Belt. This is the population by age, and you can see in these data that a large part of the working age population in particular was born elsewhere in the United States that is in New Hampshire. 
So when we were talking about the working age population in the state, a lot of them are from somewhere else in the United States. Relatively modest numbers are immigrants uh, from other countries. This is the educational attainment of those different groups of people. New Hampshire benefits from migration. A substantial proportion of the population moving into New Hampshire is well-educated. You can see that in the gra on the right-hand sides of the graphs. These are the number of college graduates and graduate uh, people with graduate degrees in New Hampshire. And that 41% of New Hampshire's population I told you was born in the state of the population over the age of 20, 25, only 32%, less than a third of the adult population in New Hampshire was born here. So migration is a really important part of what happens in New Hampshire, as you can see. These are age-specific migration data. The latest data, the, the red bars, are still, are still provisional. We're still working on these data. Um, but they tell a story of who comes to New Hampshire and who leaves New Hampshire. And you can see consistently that New Hampshire gains people in their 30s and 40s in their prime working age. That's those up bars that you can see. And they also, and their children come with them, of course. And so you can see the influx of children and the influx of working age, uh, family age adults. New Hampshire has, in some decades, experienced a loss of young adults. As far as we can tell in the last decade, between 2010 and 2020, that didn't happen. The number of young adults moving into and out of New Hampshire was essentially even. And so New Hampshire essentially retained about the same number of people in their 20s as, um, as would have been here uh, otherwise. Now, also another stereotype about New Hampshire is that lots of older adults move to New Hampshire. And you can see there is a modest influx of older adults to the state. But it's not as if everybody in Massachusetts packs up a U-Haul and moves here when they retire. So again, this is the age structure of the population and the migration patterns in the state. And again, many states would do anything to have a age-specific migration profile like this, where they're receiving lots of people in their prime working age groups, well-educated people in those age groups, and holding on to almost all of their 20-something-year-olds. Just to give you some idea of what kind of implications this has, this shows you the number of children who are born in New Hampshire, the blue bar, and the number of children who begin first grade in New Hampshire six years later. And you can see consistently more kids begin the first grade in New Hampshire than were born in the state six years previously. In other words, that's those parents coming to New Hampshire with their children. So New Hampshire, although New Hampshire school enrollment clearly is declining, as you can see, um, this influx of working age people and their children helps to keep the number of children uh, in New Hampshire in the school system higher than it would have been otherwise. I can stop here for a minute if anybody has questions about that part of my talk before I go on. I just want to keep an eye on time, just so you know. I promised we'd be done at 3, just so you know. Representative Petrie has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for a great presentation. Uh, in the last uh, probably 10 years, we've lost 25% of our public school students. You know, not lost, but the enrollments have diminished the enrollments by 25 have diminished by that mm -hmm. much. How do how do we you know maintain a labor force for that unless we have immigration? I mean, uh, have you studied that area? Right. I mean, it is migration that helps New Hampshire keep sufficient young uh, working age people to staff its employment structure. Are we, I mean, what are we, what are we gonna do about it? I mean, migration, will that, you think that will maintain uh, our workforce? I would say, I mean, given the age structure profiles of the population migrating into New Hampshire, that is an important contributor to the to the size of the labor force. Whether it will offset the decline in the number of children, I mean, that's a question for a labor economist, not for a demographer. Thank you. 
Yes, do you have a question? Right now, again, remember that we're looking at the the balance of the flow in and out of the state. So there are going to be a lot. You have to face forward so you're into the mic. There, there's going to be a lot of 20-somethings leaving the state, but in the last decade, roughly the same number came to the state. So it's that balance which produced that lack of loss in that period. Um, the data are so new that we... I haven't had time to actually try and understand exactly what's driving that or if to what extent we can. So, But again, I, 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 w it's important to recognize that there are big flows under any one of these nets. So now, as you all know from being in New Hampshire, demographic change varies across the state. This shows you the 2010 to 2020 decade uh, and compares it to 20, 2000 to 2010. Now you can see overall there's less growth in the state. There's less of the blues and dark greens. But the patterns are fairly similar. That is, you can see that there's more uh, growth in the southeast part of the state and less growth in the northern part of the state in both periods. So the overall growth slowed in 2010 to 2020 compared to the earlier decade. But the patterns are fairly similar in where the growth was and where the decline was. Just to give you a little better idea, I wanted to show you some of the counties. So I'm going to focus on three counties, Hillsborough, Carroll, and Coas. And these are, this is showing you the amount of population change, the red bar, the blue bar is natural increase, and the gray bar is migration. And so you can see that these counties have very different profiles in how they've grown or declined. So let me focus in on them. So you can see, for example, in Hillsborough County that the population growth has occurred through a combination of natural increase, more births than deaths, and also from migration. So those two things together fueled modest growth uh, in Hillsborough County. In contrast, Carroll County, which is a recreational and amenity county, uh, experiences all of its growth from migration. Now this is common, there are about 300 counties like Carroll around the United States, which are big recreational or amenity counties. And this is a very typical profile for them. That is, they receive lots of migrants, many of them older adults, near retirement age, but they, have relatively modest sized populations of childbearing age, and that plus the influx of older adults who eventually will have higher mortality produces natural decrease. Now, of course, this was accelerated. These, these data don't show the COVID period, but they were accelerated by the onset of COVID. And the other thing that is interesting here is that in the, in the period of the pandemic, we have seen in the United States generally, and in New Hampshire in particular, at least originally in the first year of the pandemic, there was an inflow of migrants to recreational and amenity counties. In some cases, they were people moving to their second homes they already owned and staying in them more because of the flexibility of work or because of their concerns with the pandemic. Uh, in other cases, it may have been people taking advantage of the flexibility of work to move to a place where they uh, had access to outside amenities and recreation, and many of them have prior experience in these places. So this was very common in the early stages of the, of the pandemic. It's a little unclear how much of that is continuing. Um, we've been looking at cell phone data and other kinds of, of data, change of address data, and it suggests that that tendency may have slowed in the second year of the pandemic, but we just don't, we don't have enough data yet at the county level to be able to do that, to tell for sure. But anyway, that's, and then Coas County, the most Northern County in the, in the state, experiences substantial natural decrease. 
And in part, this kind of natural decrease that's going on in Coas County and in a lot of other counties like it is a function of the long-term outflow of young adults from the labor from the counties. In other words, people in their 20s tend to leave counties like these. Older people stay. Over time, as the number of young people keep leaving and the older population ages in place, there are relatively few young women of childbearing age to produce children, and there are more, more older adults at high risk of mortality who began to die. And so that's the kind of impact that you can see in a county like Coas. So even in a small state like New Hampshire, you can see very different demographic tendencies playing out over the, over the, the uh, state. This is, and then here I focus in on just Hillsborough County so that you can see Nash, Manchester and Nashua compared to the rest of Hillsborough County, which I call the suburban areas. I'm, I'm sure if I were to say that in Hillsborough County, there would be objections to that in some places, but just bear with me. And you can see the very different patterns in Manchester and Nashua, which depend primarily on natural increase to fuel the increases in their population compared to the suburbs which are experiencing more migration into them uh, and also have some natural increase. Now, these patterns would be very consistent with what you would see in urban areas around the United States, larger urban areas as well. That is, that they depend a lot on natural increase and that they experience uh, relatively low levels of migration. Or out at, In many big urban areas, they may actually experience out-migration, particularly could, of domestic. Could domestics. we interrupt for a quick question, yeah. Representative Platt? Actually, a bit of a quick statement. I'm from Glassdown in Hillsborough County, one of those suburb, suburbs, and you said nothing objectionable. Good. I'm glad. Yeah. I always feel like I'm walking on eggs when I lump groups together. So any other questions about this before I move on? This is, this is age-specific change in the New Hampshire population. New Hampshire's population is aging. That's no surprise to any of you. You know, you've heard that before. But I just wanted to show you how that process is going on. So these are three different decades. The blue bar is the 1990s, the red bar is the 2000s, and the green bar is 2010 to 2019. We don't have the data at this level of detail from the 2020 census data yet. And I've got, I wanted to show you two different cohorts. That the blue cohort, the one that's labeled at the top with the blue arrows, those are people who were born between 1950 and 1959. In other words, the heart of the baby boom. New Hampshire received a big influx of baby boom era people over the period from the 1970s forward. And they've aged. And so you can see over the course of the three decades, them moving from being in their 40s to being in their 50s, to being in their 60s, and how the population in that age group grew in New Hampshire as they moved through the age structure. In contrast, the population born in the 1970s, who were the children, actually, of the baby boom, and you may remember that if you are a member of the baby boom, that your own parents kind of grudgingly waited for you to have children a little bit later than they had, there was a lag in the number of babies being born at that time. Those are relatively small cohorts. And you can see as they move through the age structure, there's a drop in the size of those age groups as they move from being in their 20s to into their 30s to into their 40s. And so you can see the shifting of New Hampshire's age structure here with the increase in the older part of the age structure and declines in the, small, in the, in the young adult part of the age structure as these cohorts move through. This is a population pyramid that demographers use to illustrate the population. The red side is women, the blue side is men. This is the age structure in 1990. So the youngest babies born between 1986 and 1990 are the ones at the very bottom who are zero to four. And the, one of those big baby boom cohorts born between 1956 and 60, you can see them in their 30s. And so this is what the age structure of New Hampshire looked like in 1990. I'm gonna let you see it age ahead now so you can see what it looks like now. Notice that the average age in New Hampshire in 1990 was 32.8.
Here it, here's that same age structure in 2000. People are aging in place, plus the migration streams are coming and going. The population gets older. That little cohort that you saw that was born, uh, that was 0 to 4 in the last slide, now is 10 to 14. And that 76 to 80 cohort, the one I told you that was small because there hadn't been as many births in that period, you can see that notch in the pyramid where they are. And then the baby boomers are now in their 40s. Here's the same pyramid in 2010. See the population aging. Median age is now 41, up from 32 in 1990. And those cohorts are moving up through the age structure. And then finally, this is the newest data that we have. And you can. one of the things I want you to see is how big those cohorts that were the baby boomers who are in the, now in their 50s and 60s and early 70s, how big they are. 214,000 in the cohort 60 to 69 and 183,000 in the cohort 50 to 59. And then notice how much smaller the cohorts behind them are. So that it's that, that bulge is coming up through the age structure and is the result of New Hampshire's population getting older. Now, as you saw from the age-specific migration data, it's not as if huge numbers of older adults are flooding into New Hampshire. It's the aging in place of New Hampshire's population that's producing this. Thank you. Does, does this imply a, a, a shrinking population going forward? And when should we start seeing it based on that data? A lot depends on what happens with migration. You can see already that the, the growth of that age structure of that older age structure is going to increase mortality in the state. There are relatively few women of childbearing age, and New Hampshire's birth rate is relatively low. So the number of children being born is diminishing. And so there will be continuing natural decrease, that is, more deaths than births in New Hampshire in the future. Whether the population of the state will grow or not depends on migration, particularly domestic migration but also to a lesser extent immigration. Just, and again, there's a lot of variability within New Hampshire. So this is the youngest, these are the children in New Hampshire. On the left-hand side is what proportion of the communities are children. And on the right-hand side is the actual number of children in those areas. So you can see, for example, in the southeast part of the state, not only are a large proportion of the pop, a larger proportion of the population children, that yellow or orange, but also that's where a lot of the children are. Now again, I, I know this is no news to you, but it just shows you how much variability there is within the state. And for a legislature that has to think about a whole state, I, I just want to hope that you recognize that there is such striking variability even within the state. This is the working age population, or six, 18 to 64 anyway. And again, you can see the same patterns. That is that there, there's more of a concentration in the southeast and the mid part of the state than in the north. And again, it's not just the distribution by percentages, which is what the left-hand graph is showing you, what proportion of the population is in this age group. You can also see in the right-hand map where the population literally is. And then this is the older population. And you can see that there are differences, that the population on average is older in the northern part of the state than it is in the southern part of the state. But the most older adults in New Hampshire are in the southern part of the state because that's where most of the population is. So this is going to create challenges for agencies and units that are age-based. For example, School systems in the northern part of the state may be worried about closing schools or cons even the dreaded word of consolidating school districts, which sets people on edge everywhere. But those same places may have growing numbers of older adults, which are going to put other demands on local government and state agencies for, for things in that, in that age group. So there's a lot of diversity within this state on age, both in where the numbers are and how the population is distributed. 
This, this is just more, this is one more point I wanted you to make. You'll often hear about how New Hampshire is the oldest or one of the oldest states in the country. And I just wanted to show on two different measures. The upper measure is the percentage of the population over 65. And you can see that New Hampshire is about eighth in terms of the population over 65. The median age in New Hampshire is the second highest. And that's primarily because so much of the New Hampshire population is in the baby boom cohorts. And so that big block of people raises the median age in the state. So New Hampshire certainly has an older population. Out where it stands in comparison to other states depends in part on how you measure it. Questions about this part before I move on? Sorry. I, I, I know you should be doing that. I'm so used to. OK. Diversity. Now, you've all heard New Hampshire is not very diverse. And in fact, it is among the least diverse states in the United States. But its diversity is increasing. And I think that has important implications for many issues that come before the state legislature. This is the diversity of, New of the United States population by county. So this is the chances that two people who meet randomly on the street would be of different racial or ethnic groups. And so the yellows and the oranges are the most diverse parts of the United States. And the blues and the greens are the least diverse parts of the United States. So you can see on a graphic like this that northern New Hampshire, northern New England is not exactly uh, among the most diverse parts of the country. This is a close-up that shows you just New England. And you can see the striking difference between the southern states in New England and the northern part of New England. There is some diversity, as I'll show you, but it, it does vary. This is New Hampshire's population in 20, from the 2020 census. So this is the racial breakdown and ethnic breakdown of the state. And the way this is set up, the white population is the non-Hispanic white population. Now, there's a lot of different ways that diversity can be measured, but the one that's used most by demographers is to treat non-Hispanic whites, and in fact, non-Hispanics as racial groups, but treat Hispanics as another group. Now, the way the Census Bureau actually asks the question is a little different than this. And Hispanics would be very unhappy about all being lumped into one category like this. Uh, just like when you used to put Italians and Swedes in the same category, you'd have problems. But anyway, that's just the way these data are defined. So this is the population of New Hampshire. About 12.8% of New Hampshire's population is minority. That is, it's not non-Hispanic white. But here's a key point. Between 19, uh, 2010 and 2020, all of the growth, all of the growth in New Hampshire's population was minority. The white, non-Hispanic white population of New Hampshire actually got smaller between 2010 and 2020, slightly smaller. So all the growth in the population came from minorities. Only the, even though they only represented 12.8% of the population, they produced all the population increase. And another key point, and this is true not just in New Hampshire, but all over the United States, the most diverse part of the population is the youngest part. And so you can see the striking contrast here. 20, over 20% 20 of New Hampshire's child population is minority, but only 11% of it's an adult population. So the diversity is coming to New Hampshire from the bottom up. So any agency or organization that deals with children is going to face diversity earlier or more, more frequently than older groups are. So I have a daughter who's a pediatrician in a hospital, and not in New Hampshire, but in the Midwest. And she will often tell me that when people come into the hospital, often the children have to translate for the parents. And she said it puts them in an, I mean, you can imagine the awkward position with the questions that doctors would have to ask about. But I mean, you can just see it's one way that this is gonna play out is with the, child population being the most diverse, um, it, it has lots of implications for schools, particularly early on. 
So again, just a key point, diversity is greater among the child population. And that's true all over the United States, not just here. The most diverse part of the population of the babies that have just been born in the United States. The least diverse are the people at the oldest age groups. So in New Hampshire, about 88% of the births are non-Hispanic white. 98% of the deaths are non-Hispanic white. May we interrupt for a quick question? Yes. Right behind you, Representative Edwards. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious what other is. Mike, as I'm sitting here guessing, I'm thinking it's multiracial or just unknown data. It's what, mul what is it yes, it's multiracial. It's uh, native Alaskans and Hawaiians. It's people um, who report that they have some other race. So this suggests that you have 100% knowledge on everyone's race in your state, or is there how, how big is your unknown or your fudge factor? These data come directly from the census, so they're the self-reported race of each individual who filled out a census questionnaire, which was filled out by approximately 98.5% of the American population. Thank you, sir. This is the change in New Hampshire's population between 2000 and 2019. So this is a 20 year period. And it shows the changes in the different age groups within the population. So the number of white children has diminished. The number of minority children increased modestly. I mean, you can see the graph. The point would be that the growth of the white population is primarily in the older population, uh, while the number of children who are non-Hispanic white has diminished. This, would be, this trend would be similar in other parts of the United States as well. This is the distribution of the population uh, by minority status in the state in 2020, according to the census. And so you can see that if you look at the population as a whole, the minority population is primarily concentrated in some areas of the state, and there are other parts of the state which have very little minority population. If you look at this for children and adults separately, you can see the change coming uh, to different parts of the state. That is, the green is the least diverse, and the oranges and reds are the most diverse. But you can see the difference, how more, much more widespread diversity is among the child population than it is among the adult population. So this just underscores, again, the fact that change is coming, even though New Hampshire is much less diverse than the nation as a whole, it's becoming more diverse through time. And if you focus, I'm going to focus now on just the corridor that you can look, you can see in the map from Nashua to uh, Manchester. This is the racial breakdown of that corridor. And so there are areas in Manchester and Nashua which are as diverse as big urban areas are, right? I mean, you've got areas where the child, the, particularly of the child population, where over 40% of the population is minority. Now you can imagine the challenges this produces for agencies and school districts that have to deal with a diverse population. And again, for people who are not from parts of the state that are diverse, recognize that even in a state like New Hampshire, there are some very diverse parts of the population uh, in some areas. Any, any questions about that before I go on? That diver the diversity is not just about race. Diversity spans a lot of different dimensions. This is, this is New England. This is education and income, where the oranges and reds are the highest education, highest income areas, and the greens are the least. Here is just New Hampshire, so you can see it. And you can see that there are large areas of New Hampshire which have extremely well-educated, high-income populations, and other parts of the state which have more modest income distributions and where uh, higher education levels are less. This is educational attainment by, uh, by among adults. These are adults, 25 and over, by race and Hispanic origin. So again, you can see that there's quite a bit of variability from the Asian population, which is relatively small, but has an extremely high education level uh, to other groups where education levels are not as high or are more evenly distributed. So again, I, my point is just that there's a diversity along a, a, among a variety of different characteristics. 
This is income. So you can see variability in income distributions as well from families that are earning relatively low incomes of 50,000 or less up to very well uh, high income families and how they distribute. This is, New Hampshire is very fortunate in that he has either the lowest or the second lowest poverty rate in the United States, particularly for children. But that doesn't mean that there isn't poverty in the state and that um, it doesn't vary across the state, both by race and ethnicity and by uh, poverty, by geography. So there are areas of the state, particularly for children that are have relatively high poverty rates and other parts of the state where poverty for children is relatively unknown. So again, my point here is just that there's diversity in the state along a variety of gradients from population to age to race to income. So even though it's a small state, it is remarkably diverse along a number of different dimensions. One last point, uh, I want you to notice that the demographer is going to finish on time, even if the economist yeah. didn't. <laughs> Why do people move to and why do they stay in New Hampshire? We've done a lot of research on this. Uh, and this is with my graduate student now, PhD, uh, Christine Budchu. Um, we asked, we didn't use check boxes. We actually asked a large cross-section of New Hampshire residents to tell us in their own words why they stayed in New Hampshire or if they moved here recently, why they moved to New Hampshire. And these are the answers we got. So you can see that family reasons, and that varies. If it's older adults, it's because they want to be close to their grown children or their grandchildren. If it's younger families, they want to be close to their, their parents so that they can have help with childcare and all the other things that come with being a young parent. But family was an important reason. The natural environment, the beauty of New Hampshire, the access to lakes and mountains were all very attractive, both to residents who have been here for a long time and for recent arrivals. Quality of life, which they meant they felt safe, they felt that they were part of a community, was another factor. And then you can see employment and taxes, culture, all kinds of other factors. And one important point we found also was that people don't come here or stay here for only one reason. They come or stay for a variety of reasons. So it's not any one of these things that brings people to New Hampshire or keeps them here. It's a combination of them. And given how important migration is to the state's future, I think it's important that we recognize that there are these multifaceted things that cause people to come to the state or stay. And again, when you think about growing New Hampshire, there's two ways you can do it. You can attract people to the state, but you can also retain more of your people. You can lose fewer of them. And that's gonna keep the population, I mean, that's gonna keep the losses from going down as migration into the state uh, increases. So just, Migration, as I said, migration is important to New Hampshire. Again, I want to emphasize new people don't come to New Hampshire or stay in New Hampshire for just one reason. They're influenced by a variety of factors. So policies aimed at both attracting people or retaining people are going to be something that will help New Hampshire. Um, so, for example, when you talk about making New Hampshire attractive to families, that's about the quality of education. That's about access to childcare. All of those kinds of factors are important. If you're talking about uh, the state's, the beauty of the state, that's preserving the state's natural resources, that's improving the parks, that's committing more resources to conservation. Um, again, recognize that there's a lot of different facets to this. So just in conclusion, Population and growth has slowed compared to what it was in previous decades. We're not, people are not flooding into the state the way they were in the 70s and 80s and 90s. The most recent census data we have suggests that there is a significant amount of domestic migration going into the state, that people are coming to 
New Hampshire from other places in the United States. We don't have as much immigration, but there's still a modest amount of immigration. We, we talked a little bit about how there are fewer births going on right now, and there are more deaths because of COVID. Now, again, that happened, started to happen before COVID. So even as the deaths from COVID diminish as they are now, it's not as if we're going to return to a, a unless there's some remarkable change in women's childbearing behavior, we're not going to have another baby boom that's going to produce a lot of child growth in New Hampshire. I wanted you to see that demographic change in New Hampshire is uneven. Some areas are growing. Other areas are declining. Some, some school districts are going to worry about opening a new school. Other, students, other school districts are going to have to worry about how can they consolidate two elementary schools into one. Diversity is growing in the state, but it remains largely non-Hispanic and white. And New Hampshire's population is aging. So just some final implications that migration is important is an important source of human capital for the state. The people who come to the state are well-educated. Um, they Some of them are bringing children with them as well. The state needs both to attract those people, but also to retain its existing population, not lose them. Diver uh, we talked about diversity remaining modest. Again, remember that diversity is greatest for the youngest and least among the oldest of the population. The population change patterns are uneven in the state. Some, sta some places are going to have to cope with expansion and growth. Others are going to have to deal with contraction, which in many ways is more difficult for places to deal with. And the growing older population is going to produce a lot of challenges for the state. So thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Representative Janigian. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, do you track at all the, um, the reasons that people leave the state? I wish we could. It's, it's a hard, I mean, if you think about the way we we use the Granite State Poll, which is a University of New Hampshire polling organization, which takes a poll of the state every three months. We put our questions on about 12 or 15 of their surveys. They reach the people of the state. Reaching the people who leave is a lot more difficult to do. It's not impossible, but it's a lot more difficult. So we know less about why people leave than why they come. Thank you. Representative Almy. Thank you. I'm looking at these charts of diversity, mm -hmm. and it seems to me that there's a major split in the Hispanic and black sectors of the, of the population. The Hispanics and blacks have higher family income and higher um, educational attainment. But when you turn to the next page, and you're looking at poverty levels, they also have the higher poverty levels. Right. I mean, they, they so, don't have as high income levels as other racial groups, but they have moderately high poverty levels. A part of the question would be which parts of the population, I mean, it, it, it's possible that the parts of the population with relatively um, high income are not the parts that have a lot of children either yet or their children are grown. So I haven't looked in detail at it. Um, I just to, like to apologize. I can't read the small print on these things. I'm and sorry. This is the percentage of people in that group right. is higher on with educational attainment than, than the percentage of people in a white group, for instance. Okay. Which is a somewhat different thing. Representative Edwards has a question. Madam Chair, um, I'm just curious if there's any preliminary data that suggests that we had a COVID lockdown, mini baby boom, at least a baby boom big enough to where we need to start worrying about child care and education implications. Yes, I've been asked this question a number of times at a number of different levels of geography. There, there was a slight uptick in births in New Hampshire last year. New Hampshire, again, has low birth rates. There was an uptick in births last year 
but the number of births declined again this year. So um, there is no evidence of a baby boom either in New Hampshire or at the national level. Um, people, I mean, I got questions from the national media a lot about this. Um, here are all these people at home with nothing else to do. Are we going to have a baby boom? Uh, demographers generally said, no, it's not going to happen. And in fact, it didn't happen. I mean, there, so there, there hasn't been a baby boom. Thank you. Representative McGuire behind you has a question. Related to that, um, when do we know how many births there were in 2022? Do we know that now? Is that we, now? Is that we have preliminary data for the period from, um, for the first half of 2022. And the number of births in the first half of 22 uh, are down slightly from what they were in 2021. We, I mean, there's always a lag in when birth data is reported. Um, I mean, it's, uh, it's a problematic in a state like New Hampshire in particular, because some births that are to New Hampshire residents will occur in hospitals in Massachusetts and it takes a while for the data to all get moved back into, so. Representative Bolton. It's more of a statement, but um, I was a state registrar in 2008 and I retired, you know, towards 2009. And when I was registrar, we had 15,000 births and 9,500 deaths. So you can't blame this on me. <laughs> and uh, regarding the uh, births uh, enumeration, we, we actually developed a program called Never and Web. And if you're looking at just uh, events of birth, death, marriage, divorce, and fetal death, it's immediately reported um, as, the, uh, you know, as the event occurs. So if you want to Google you know, Never and Web, you can create a login and check out. All I actually data. use that quite often. Excellent. Well, I but that's one thing you can thank me for, but I mean, it was uh, actually not really well received because people thought that it may, it may need time to like ripen the data, but um, it became lauded after a while because it was just immediate access to, to data like that. So anyway, huh. thank you. Senator Lang. Uh, Representative McGuire. Representative McGuire. So the um, Office of Vital Statistics, right, I think, believe it's in the Secretary of State's office, they'll get you the most current data if you just ask them. They're, they've they been really good. So were you saying that the previous answer is sort of wrong, that, that right now it's known what's available, how many births in 2020? You can um, essentially, well, with regard to the, the births that occur like out of state, it may take a while to, to grab those. But for the events that occurred in New Hampshire, um, you would get them within a day. As the hospital reports it, you you have access to it. You're welcome. Sorry, a lot of the, my answer was coming mostly from NCHS, the National Center for Health Statistics, because I'm not looking just at New Hampshire, but at a lot of other states too. Excellent presentation. Thank you so Thank much. You. And your time management is exceptional. <laughs> but your data is fabulous, too. Thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy. It. I hope you all enjoy this as much as I did. I will look to see you at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Hopefully tomorrow's a little bit shorter day, though. Hopefully we'll be done by noon, 1230 at the latest. Thanks so much. We have this room tomorrow, so if you want to leave your binders and stuff here, you can leave it right on the table in front of your name tag. No Monday. No Monday. Monday is M MLK. Just Tuesday. Just Tuesday.